for each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. <clears throat> Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County. This a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. First on our agenda is the adoption of August 18, 2021 minutes. Commissioners, do you have any questions or is there a motion? Madam Chairman, I move for approval. There's a motion. Second. Thank you for the second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed. The motion carries. Ms. Ziegler, are there any changes to our agenda? We do. There are three that um, have requested deferral. They'd like to continue to work on their um, proposals. That's 1010 Forest, demolition at 1406 Fifth Avenue North, and a violation at 308 310 Broadway. That's 308 to 310. And then uh, 1533 Douglas is also removed. They made some changes so that they could get an administrative permit. That's okay. All. Thank you for that. Commissioners, any other questions or is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Madam Chairman, I move for adoption of the agenda. Thank you for the motion. Thank you for the second. All in favor? Uh, okay. None opposed. The motion carries. Okay, who's presenting the consent agenda? I'm so oh, sorry, before we move to consent agenda, well. yep. uh, we do have at least two council members yes, here. Yes, um, apologies to the council members. <laughs> uh, Councilman Withers and Council Lady Kathleen Murphy, um, would you like to have any comments or would you like to uh, wait? I'll go ahead if that's all right. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you so much for having me and letting me go first. Um, I know I have some neighbors here for the bowling house uh, expansion, and I apologize that I have to leave. Uh, I got my dates confused, and my grandfather is 98 and had his second um, cancer surgery this weekend or this week. So I, he kind of trumped a few things on my agenda. So I appreciate that understanding. Um, this expansion. Uh, Y'all might recall, I think some of you are still on here when we did the first bowling house overlay. It was a very small overlay. If you remember the history of overlays in Sylvan Park can be pretty contentious. And so when neighbors have approached me about overlays, I wanted them to be pretty small to start with. And then if other people want to join in, we can address that at that time. I've also really stressed that, that overlays, especially in Sylvan Park, need to be neighbor led and neighbor to neighbor conversations going on about the importance or why they want to support an overlay, so on and so forth. And so followed my typical method that I have with the original bowling house overlay and then the Whitland overlays that I know Cyril is more familiar with, where basically we have some information meetings and neighbors send me um, their questions, which I typically forward on to more the policy experts, um, and then I tally up responses. And this time, um, the neighborhood assigned block captains who were really great, and I know some of them are here today and will be speaking. And so the map that I have submitted into the record, um, I just got around to putting together this week, and so it is my traditional uh, magic marker colored in uh, map of where neighbors have either emailed me that they support or oppose or have talked to me in some way 
or a lot of it is based off of those neighbor to neighbor communications and a master list of that those neighborhood block captains shared with me. So overall, um, this is a pretty, um, I would think big expansion of that bowling house overlay because it is pretty small how it is now, but I think it is very appropriate. Uh, the numbers of contributing houses in this expanded area is very similar to what you'd already approved in the original bowling house overlay. And so basically I did break it down into blocks and the overall to just run those numbers to help make, make a decision of whether this needs to move forward or not. And at the end of the day, in totality, it is 67%. And I believe that is more than the original uh, bowling house overlay that we that was approved by y'all. Um, of, I, I am super impressed that the neighbors going door to door got a 74% response rate of properties in this uh, expansion area. And of that 74% response rate, there's 63% support. So um, I think that there's, and if you look at the map, I'm a visual person, there's definitely a lot of support in this area for the expanded overlay. I know that y'all have received some emails requesting that a house or two or a block or two get taken out. That is something that I would love y'all's input on if you feel that that is appropriate or not as we go through this process um, between here and planning and then at council. Obviously no changes can be made until we get to the council area, but there is um, that, because I also color coordinated this map too. <laughs> I know that there are some concerns of property owners um, up in this region of it. And so it is an area that has less contributing houses. And so I think it's something that we need to continue to discuss. Over the course of the summer, neighbors asked me to participate in a, in a phone call because there were neighbors interested in how overlays happen. So I participated in that call simply as a, yes, that's kind of how the process works or answering, you know, how do things go? Then we mailed, um, the council office mailed postcards to the houses in the, um, within the boundaries of what was being proposed. And we invited them to a virtual meeting. And then we also had another um, virtual meeting uh, as this was being filed. Uh, and so I believe that would be a series of two or three community meetings that I had historic at. It may have just been two this time. And so um, from there is really how we came to this, this conclusion and why we were before y'all today. Again, I feel like overlays, especially in Sylvan Park, need to be neighbor led. This one, just like the original bowling house, was neighbor led. And so since they have demonstrated so much support of this to me, I am supportive of it today and plan to continue to move it forward if y'all feel it is appropriate and the Planning Commission feels it is appropriate. And so I'm happy to answer any questions now if you have them um, or uh, whatever else you, you might need to know from me. Thank you, Council Member. Commissioners, any questions? Right. Council Member, do you um, feel that, um, do you need to have another meeting? I don't, let me just say not need, but since that um, it's all good at this point and Again, you've said that you want to move forward, but just want to just get some additional opinions from you. I think at this point, since we do have that 75 or 74 percent response rate, um, which only has eight um, eight parcels, property owners um, opposing it, I think at this time it's ready to move forward. I think if more questions, comments, and things move, come up because we all know that after mailings go out and signs go up, we start to get some more questions and things. And so I think at that time, if, if more arise, then I definitely will do another informational session so we can get, if we can't get them answered, um, one-off individual questions. Again, that's the benefit of having kind of a smaller air, geographical area is we can answer a lot of those site-specific questions. Sure. So at this time, I, I feel like because the opposition um, is around 11% and we've got 63% of support out of that 74% response rate, I feel very confident moving forward with the numbers we have. If that were to change, then yes, I would have another community meeting before we get to the council process. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. All right, thanks y'all. Thank you.
Councilman Withers. All righty. Uh, thank you so much, commissioners, um, for, for your time today. I, I have another Metro meeting at three o'clock. Uh, on campus here, so uh, I regret that I can't stay for the whole meeting this time. And also just wanted to uh, uh, say that we, um, we do have a demolition request for a historic church building uh, on this agenda. Those are always uh, sad things to see. We've had a lot of that with the tornado recovery area in uh, East Nashville. This is a, a very iconic building uh, that has meant a lot to the East Nashville community for more than a century. And uh, everyone has taken this application very seriously. Um, and the team that is, is working on this application includes members of that church who have done fundraising to restore it for uh, probably the decade that I've known them. Uh, so everyone involved in the application for this uh, wants to see that building saved and has worked to preserve it up, up to the day that it was hit by the tornado and since then. Um, so it's a very sad thing, but uh, I'm satisfied that the community uh, is sad about it but understands the necessity of it. Uh, we trust these design professionals that live and work in our community and, and again, are even members of that church that um, that they that they have tried everything that they could do to save that building. We did have a community meeting with the East End Neighborhood Association. Um, and I think that the uh, presentation about plans for rebuilding the structure in a, in a way that's more functional and respects the history of the building were very re well received by those in attendance. And so um, uh, I want you to, fully vet the application, which I'm sure that you will, and, and I know that you'll have a good presentation, but uh, I, I regretfully uh, do express my support for the demolition of this structure uh, with the understanding that architectural salvage will occur and many of these uh, salvageable architectural elements will be reincorporated into the structure that gets built back. So that's the best possible outcome we could have under this scenario. Uh, so I, I do support that and wanted to comment on that. Um, I have provided written comments on a couple of other cases for today. I did want to uh, speak briefly about um, 1204 Russell Street. I had come before you two meetings ago with Mr. Hurtado, who's here today. Um, at that time, I had requested to give him a little bit uh, more time and give us all a breath to uh, look at the plans for that building. Um, I appreciate that. I think Mr. Hurtado has worked with an architect to, to try to develop a plan that you can review. Um, uh, it does involve some modifications to what was constructed, but I think that this is a much better process than in, in this case than you know demolishing all of what was built and leaving a structure there further exposed to the elements and unsupported. Um, I, I think that this approach, I appreciate your mercy uh, of the commission in granting that time to Mr. Hurtado. I think that that's worked pretty well. We do have plans that for a revision to the addition. I believe the staff recommendation is for approval of those revised plans. Um, and I've uh, spoken with Mr. Hurtado. He, um, I, I believe that he uh, supports it, although his architect will speak. But it's my understanding that Mr. Hurtado supports the staff recommendation. Uh, uh, so I think we're getting to a good place. Hasn't been 100% perfect, but it's much better than doing a demolition and then trying to build something back and further risking what remained of the historic structure. Um, I know neighbors also get frustrated with a lot of construction going on next door, and I would too. And uh, I think that this process of sort of generally taking a, a break uh, from activity altogether for a while has been in the best interest of the long-term outcome of the building. Uh, so I just appreciate Mr. Hurtado and the staff and you as commissioners and everyone who's continuing to work together on that. So I think Mr. Hurtado is going to speak and is going to present or his architect is going to present requesting support of the staff recommendation. And, and I'm comfortable with that as well. I do have another neighbor uh, from 1609 Douglas. Um, I had uh, met with the homeowner uh, prior to their hearing. But like I said, I had a death in the family and had to miss the last meeting and I've been uh, in and out of the state quite a bit uh, dealing with family matters. So I apologize to that homeowner that I haven't been able to follow up with her quite as much to provide that same level of case management. And so I don't have any specific comments on that one, but do want to apologize to that homeowner that I wasn't able with my travels to be as involved in that case as I had, had been able to do with Mr. Hurtado uh, since that started before. But um, those are my comments for today. Like I said, other than a couple of written comments I provided and if you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer those before I go to my next meeting. Thank you, Council Member. Anyone have questions? 
we always appreciate your presence and also your uh, experience and in your district. So thank you for all you do there. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Have a great day. Okay. The first thing on consent today is the administrative permits issued for the month. 207 Broadway is an application for signage. 908 McCarn Street, also 201 Rosebank, is new construction of an outbuilding. 224 Cherokee Road, new construction, addition, and a setback determination. 1417 Holly Street, new construction of an addition with a setback determination. 915 Gilmore Avenue, new construction of an addition and an outbuilding dadu, also partial demolition. 2400 Oakland Avenue, new construction of an addition with a setback determination. 601 Press Place, alteration, uh, it's for a mural. 2810 Belmont Boulevard, new construction of an addition. 926 Bradford Avenue, new construction of an addition. 1903 Holly Street, new construction of an outbuilding. 1906 Belmont Boulevard, new construction of an addition. 200 Broadway, new construction of a rooftop addition with window and storefront alterations. Staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda with the applicable conditions, finding the applications to meet the design guidelines of their respective overlays. Thank you, Jenny. Commissioners, any questions? Okay, if there's none, is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda. There's a motion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you for the second. All in favor? Any uh, none opposed? So the motion carries. Thank you. If I could, I'd like to make a little introduction for this next project, which is the Bowling House District that Council Member Murphy talked about. Um, the Center for Historic Preservation at Middle Tennessee loaned us help this summer to work on a different project, uh, Meredith Funder Burke. And she um, took this on as an extra project and led the Architectural Resource Survey. So she's going to be giving the presentation today. Mike's mm -hmm. Mic's on. Okay. Um, the request is to extend the Bowling House District. Council Member Murphy hosted virtual. Um, excuse me for just a minute. Could you just speak either? Yes, thank okay. you. We Sorry. can hear you better. Thank you. Should I start over? Sure. Okay. Um, the request is to extend, expand the Bowling House District. Council Member Murphy hosted virtual community meetings on June 21st and August 23rd, 2021. The Bowling House District is part of the Greater Sylvan Park neighborhood that was established as a neighborhood conservation zoning overlay in 2017. The expansion area is similar to the existing overlay in that it is residential buildings constructed primarily between 1900 and 1950. The styles are also similar to the existing district, but the forms differ slightly from differ slightly in that the buildings are all one and one and a half story simple cottages and bungalows. Combining the existing and the proposed, the new overlay would be 56% contributing. The expansion meets Criterion 1 as a prime example of the suburban development and growth of Nashville. It meets Criterion 3 as an excellent collection of turn of the 20th century residential buildings. Staff suggests the commission recommend the expansion of the Bowling House District to Metro Council, finding the properties to meet criteria of Section 1736120A, 1 and 3 of the ordinance, and recommends adoption of the existing guidelines, finding it meets the requirements of the Secretary of Interior standards. Thank you. So we'll open up public hearing. Those who wish to speak on this, please come forward and say your name and address. My name is Katie Lamb. I live at 4400 Nebraska Avenue. I've lived there for 30 years. Um, I'll be the first to say there's no accounting for taste, but I think neighborhoods in Nashville tend to have a feel to them. They are cohesive in the design of the houses. Um, 
And in Sylvan Park, it's cottages, bungalows, little Victorians, as those pictures illustrated, one and a half story um, houses that were built sometime. Mine is 100 years old. Um, and we've had builders come to Sylvan Park for the last 10 or 15 years, and they build big houses, street to alley big houses. But in about 98% of the cases, they tend to pay some homage to the style of their surroundings. They have gables, they have shutters, they have porches. And um, so that was good. But then we had a builder come that decided that they had a formula and they got a hold of a piece of property where there were two little duplexes. That allowed them to build four big houses. And that's what they did. Um, and they were, they are three-story boxes. They are taller than the uh, telephone poles. They go lot to lot as far as they could go. And they dwarf the structures that are near them. And the only way we can keep that from happening again in this neighborhood or repeatedly in this neighborhood is to get a conservation overlay. Um, the Bowling House original overlay saved the what was known as the original Sylvan Park House, which is the Bowling House. And um, we don't want more to happen to destroy the feeling of our neighborhood, which is why we chose to live there. And um, I think that this time, I've worked on an overlay twice in this area in the 30 years, this time we had an impetus, and it didn't take long at all for us to get the consensus that Kathleen talked about. Right. So I hope you approve it. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, David DePerzio. I live at 4913 Wyoming Avenue. Uh, previously, in a Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association meeting, there was a discussion to make a historic overlay, uh, which is different from a con conservation overlay, although it is part of the historic commission. I had redone my one and a half story bungalow. It's now a one and three quarters story bungalow in conformance with the guidelines, which were set by the historic group. And uh, in the most recent SPNA meeting, there was universal acceptance, although a very small number, I was objecting, that uh, we have some form of a conservation overlay. And I would believe that if we were to extend beyond the current Nebraska or the Utah Avenue overlay in such a manner as Kathleen Murphy has stated that we would also possibly get an approval from residents in the neighborhood to keep a conservation overlay for the majority of Sylvan Park. And I was hoping that at some point we could attempt to do that more than just on a street by street basis because these these big houses are very nice looking, but the ones that now are being put up do not conform to anything that is any part of the interior Sylvan Park area. That's all my, I have to say. Thank you very much. Anyone else? You have two minutes. <laughs> I'll be briefer. <laughs> I'm Linda Luther, 4403 Utah Avenue. I live in a little bungalow there, and I just want to express my uh, intent to uh, support the conservation overlay for, for this area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan McClellan, I'm 4408 Colorado, so right uh, outside of where the new overlay is, is proposed and you know, I, I just I, my house is also 80 to 100 years old and a lot of my neighbors have, have done infill or demolished their house and done a new one um, I'm one of the few one story buildings there um, but at some point in time I'd like to 
potentially renovate my house. And I feel like, uh, you know, the requirement for a hipped roof, I had to Google what a hipped roof is, but from when I Google it, it's more expensive and it's more susceptible to leaking. And, you know, when the first overlay was passed two years ago, it was right outside of where I live, but now another one's looks like could potentially be in the process of passing. So I don't know how many overlays we're going to have, but I know for a fact that, and I know of the monstrosities that have popped up, and I don't like them either, but I think there's a better way to approach this. And I think a contextual overlay is less uh, onerous on someone like me that has an 80-year-old house um, that may at one point in time, you know, uh, want to do a renovation. This just seems very uh, onerous for me as a homeowner. So I, I'd like to avoid the big, huge industrial four, four or five story things that are popping up, but I don't think this is the right way to do it. I've got a simple bungalow that was built in 1949. I'd love for it to be uh, non contributing or something, but I'd like to have the flexibility as a homeowner and taxpayer to, to, to do a renovation that's tasteful, like. 85% of the other new infill houses. So I'm worried about the expansion of this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no one else, I will close public hearing. Okay. Commissioners? <clears throat> I think our charge today is, of course, we've heard um, from our council person and also some of the neighbor committees and we've had some public comment sent to us um, but our charge is to recommend this if or if not to planning and then it will go to council Madam Chair um, I think uh, if I know the process, because this is the first body to uh, weigh in if this uh, overlay is appropriate or not, and to determine if we have neighborhood support or not, and then move to uh, planning commission, and then move to council. So uh, we do have so many steps to actually finalize this plan. So having said that, uh, as far as you know, listening uh, from council lady and reading bunch of support from a uh, neighborhood. And of course, when change happens, there's always one or two, you know, handful of people who would like to remain as is for the maybe future expansion or a worry and so forth. But as a body, I am uh, comfortable recommending it, knowing, you know, we do have large Sylvan Park uh, you know, potentially saving worse neighborhood and houses. So as a first step, as a body, I think we can, I'm comfortable recommending it. And then when it's a process move along, you know, council lady can read, uh, you know, talk with more property owners. And then if opt out or, you know, shrink or is appropriate at this time, I think it's her purview to do that. But as a body, I, I am very comfortable uh, recommending, you know, uh, this uh, approval. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair. It's exciting to see this uh, level of neighborhood support. Uh, this is a very high percentage for conservation overlays. I'm especially glad to see how many people uh, actually participated and voted one way or the other. Uh, a very small number didn't vote one way or the other, and I can understand that, but uh, it's great to see the neighbors come together, work together to try to do something that, uh, that does help to keep some controls on the neighborhood. I, I support it heartily. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I'll echo what the previous two commissioners said and, and also say that, you know, again, echo Commissioner Johnson that this is the first step, and, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, there was talk even with Councilmember Murphy of, you know, cutting people out or whatnot, but I, I don't see that as our purview today of, of doing that. Um, you know, the, the boundaries come out of these neighborhood discussions and they come to us as a body, and so that's, those are the ones that are, that are there now. Um, and then it, as 
as we've seen, there's a percentage enough for it to be eligible, and so that is what we were voting on today. Um, and so therefore, I'm, I'm in favor of it as well. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chairman, with uh, respect to, I'm sorry, do we have, we have one more? <laughs> no, go ahead. Commissioner, are you sure? Go ahead. Would like to hear from you. No, I was just, everyone said everything so well that I was thinking, so I'm in agreement. It's always good to get consensus. Uh, Madam Chairman, with respect to, um, to the uh, bowling uh, district uh, conservation overlay expansion, I recommend that we uh, move forward with recommending approval uh, based on staff recommendations. Thank you. Second. There is a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Okay. None opposed, so the motion passes. Does that motion include the design adoption of the design guidelines? Should we state that or we just yes. assumed? Yes. <laughs> Can you go ahead and take that vote again just to make sure it's in the record? Okay. Sure. Should we state? Yeah, and this, this motion would include adoption of, of uh, design guidelines as well. Yeah. Motion and the second. Yes. Thank you for reminding us of that. Yes, go ahead we'll and do, do it again. Too. Yes. Um, there's a motion, there's a second. All in favor? Yeah, none opposed, so it does pass. Thank you. And thank you, neighborhood community, for coming and speaking thank your you. voice. So 1609 Douglas Avenue is a non-contributing house located... Kelly, I think I'm going to need to have you speak into the mic just a little closer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a little bit quiet, so it's always nice to know. <laughs> um, so 1609 Douglas Avenue is a non-contributing house located in the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. An administrative permit was issued for an addition on July 11th, 2021. The permit was for a two-story rear addition that... That was proposed to be no taller than the existing structure. A rear cover, uncovered porch was also included. An inspection in July of the property found that the project exceeded beyond the scope of the work for the permit. The building was taller than what was permitted, the footprint is larger, and a dormer, which was not requested, was also installed. Staff suggested three different solutions for this project, but the applicant chose to keep the addition as is. The applicant provided as-built drawings as per staff's and the commission's request. Based on these plans, the width and length of the addition is appropriate because of the building is not contributing. It also meets the guidelines for setbacks and for window proportions and openings. The height of the structure, however, creates a form that is not historic, that's not historic and that, excuse me. The height of the structure, however, creates a form that is not historically seen and contributes to a roof form that is not proportionate with the existing structure and does not fit in with the historic context. The dormer is also sitting too high on the roof line and appears to be sitting between two floors, which can make the dormer unusable. So staff, again, recommended three different designs, and we have determined that option B has the best, no, meets the design guidelines the best. This plan would alter the existing roof line so that it's not one long slope, allowing the building to better fit in with surrounding context, while also allowing the applicant to keep the two-story addition. It also moved the dormer down the roof line to better fit the historic context and to make the dormer operable. Staff recommends disapproval of the new, the new addition as is at 1609 Douglas, finding that the project does not meet Section 4 for materials and Section 6 for additions. Staff recommends approval of staff provided option B with the condition that all materials are administratively approved and partial demolition to meet option B take place within 60 days. Find that option B meets the design guidelines for additions. Thank you, Kelly. Applicant? Good evening, I'm Dr. Shanika Lachey Gregory. Um, I'm a partial owner with my father since my mom passed at 1609 East Douglas. And um, 
as when we deferred, when we went and had the meeting, um, as, as you can see, the design that the Historica have is not the actual design of our house. It doesn't have the front, um, or the right side. It doesn't have my mom's front part. It's just, they have it just going straight up. Huh? Um, yeah, it don't have the gable. I'm sorry, I just didn't know how to pronounce um, it. I apologize. Um, just one moment. So uh, we, we will give you a chance to speak if you would like. Uh, uh, Understand that, sir, but the applicant is speaking at the moment. Okay, so it doesn't have the front gable on the um, action um, option B. Um, as you can see, um, the issue, we're at the cuffs of the overlay. We're right there. Like, if I jump over the railroad, I'm not even in the overlay anymore. Um, we're at the end. So all I'm asking is that you all let us keep building our house. If, if you look at it, when I look at the houses around it, we're all in the same size shapes. They're larger, so you know, the roofs. But if anything, just enlarge my dorm or like my next door neighbors and across the street to take away the roof line because it's more expensive to take down the roof than to add, I mean, to, to have the dorm to um, fit in. I provided measurements to show exactly where my dorm was as requested. Um, and so with that, I asked, could they not, you know, help me form it so that it can blend in and not take up the roof? But of course, I didn't get that. So I'm just asking moving forward that if you look at all the houses in the street, these are either on my street or meet vertically at the end of both ends of my street, and all these houses are large. And so I'm just asking that you all let us keep building. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. Anyone else would like to speak? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julie Hagen. I'm the owner and resident of 1607B, which when looking at the Gregory's is to directly to the left. Uh, I just kind of want to start by saying thank you for your efforts. I, I know this is kind of a thankless task, and I understand that your ultimate goal is to improve the neighborhoods of Nashville. Uh, with that being said, I believe the code's violation related to the Gregory home boils down to a simple misunderstanding that can have detrimental effects. I come here on behalf of my street and our neighbors. We fully support the Gregory's addition. They're greatly improving their home and thus our neighborhood. I know it's hard to dig into each family's circumstances. However, on behalf of my neighbors, I request that you understand this family's situation and you grant them some grace. The Gregory's have adapted and been resilient this last year. I would hate for a misunderstanding to stop them now. I believe and I know there are homes that need codes intervention. However, this is not one of them. And I support this project and hope they can keep working. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I will close public hearing. Now, first, I want to um, thank the applicants for working with our staff and thank the staff for the work they've put in to try to find a solution for this. These, uh, th these violations are very difficult, uh, and, uh, and we've, all of our commissioners have been through the documents and looked through all that and uh, felt like things were pretty clear from a documentation standpoint. Uh, we, we understand that there are different ways of looking at that. And, Different conversations have different outcomes depending on who's listening and who's talking. Um, and I really appreciate the, everybody working together to try to find a solution for this. Uh, I do think that uh, out of the options that were developed, option B does seem to, uh, to continue and allow them to maintain some of what's been built and make some modifications uh, that would bring this into conformance. Uh, the, the real problem that we have with just blanket accepting uh, something that's been built, obviously with disregard to the plans that were approved, uh, winds up uh, setting precedent for other projects. We get a lot of these and, uh, and it's just not something that we're able to do to 
to grant exceptions when plans uh, that were approved uh, are, are ignored. Other comments? Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you uh, since I'm not a trained architect, so I have spent so much time looking at you know, the as-built drawing and staff recommendation. But my conclusion is uh, staff recommendation compared to as-built, uh, the applicant will not lose any bedroom as-built. Uh, that is my understanding. Just staff recommendation will contextually meet with uh, the neighborhood uh, within the contextual overlay. So that is my reading. So I would appreciate either staff's uh, confirmation or maybe uh, Vice Chair Stewart, <laughs> is this Just, uh, you are reading as well? Can, can we get that option B up on the screen? Thank you. As built in. That was the option B. So my uh, specific technical question uh, to maybe the staff is, uh, the staff recommendation is moving the front gable lower and push the front. So I think, you know, if applicant don't want to move that DOMA, they do have, maybe they can ask uh, our staff again to kind of modify, just modify the roof line to not including the DOMA. Would that be an option? Because yes. I think, you know, uh, the additional uh, roof line going over way, way, way high, so that's the, like a monstrous uh, impression. But if we can kind of lower that portion without losing the bedroom, that would be our best option. And of course, you know, DOMA would be nice addition, but if applicant doesn't want to follow that DOMA, would that be an option? I'm yes. trying to kind of, you know, get that. Yes, uh, they didn't mid, ask for the dormer in the first place, so it'd be no problem taking it off. Okay, okay, great. So with that, uh, I think, you know, staff recommendation with uh, some kind of father working with uh, uh, applicant, I think uh, that's a great compromise. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Another architect opinion? Um, I, just, I think um, Commissioner Stewart said this so well. It's these cases are really difficult, um, and it's it's hard when when things are misunderstood or things are built out of compliance. Whether I mean whether they were understood or not, it, it's it's just a difficult thing to see happen, and it's hard to ask you know to ask applicants to make. Um, such drastic changes, but if we didn't, you know, our our role is to enforce the guidelines, and um, if we don't, then anything can be built, and it, it it's unfortunate. Um, but I, I think option B, I, I really applaud staff for working through various options, and and it seems to be a good compromise with the fewest modifications to get us there from where we are. Um, so I just, I'm in support of option B as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jones, do you have any comments? I mean, I just echo what the other commissioners have said. These are just so difficult, but, you know, I just, just like what Commissioner Stewart said, you know, they just, every month I feel we get, you know, things of photos of, of other projects that we approved and, um, that, you know, if it was a, an exception, you know, to the rule. And um, so I agree. I liked, I liked uh, Commissioner Johnson's kind of uh, thought on this and, and her detailed look at these and, and what we think would work. And, and I applaud, you know, honestly, I don't know if I've ever seen, I don't know if staff created these drawings, but I don't know if I've ever seen staff created drawings before. So that shows, I mean, how much work has gone into trying to, to make this work for for the applicant and the guidelines. Um, so I just, you know, that's something that I hadn't seen before. So that's just a lot of work um, on historic staff's behalf part. And um, I appreciate that, you know, as a commissioner, kind of bringing us 
visuals of what, you know, what might work or to see what we think would work. Um, and, I, and I agree with staff and fellow commissioners on this option B of, um, it's really just that roof line that, that I think is, is far out of compliance and, and bringing that in um, is something that I'm uh, in favor of. Okay. okay, commissioners, is there a motion? Sure, uh, based on this discussion and all that's been presented, uh, I, uh, uh, make a motion that we disapprove the new addition as is, and that we uh, and that we recommend and that we approve uh, the staff provided option B, with the condition that all materials are administratively approved and partial demolition to meet option B takes place within 60 days. And uh, would would further add that would encourage uh, not only the applicant but for but others who might be watching this broadcast that for any changes to any of these plans, and, and there can be changes. For instance, working with the staff uh, with the dormer is one of those, but to make sure that any changes go before uh, the Historic Commission staff uh, for approval prior to making those changes. So with that, that's my motion. Okay. In addition to that too, is that when, um, to be clear on the permitting process, I think that's what governs that as well. Um, so f again, for those that are listening in in our public hearing is that it's really important to, to follow what you have presented as your permit. Second okay. motion. Okay, there's a first and there's a second. All in favor of the motion? Okay, none opposed, so the motion passes. Fourteen seventeen Russell Street is located in the Lockland Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zone and Overlay. The original home was was contributing to the district, but was approved for demolition in October of 2020 due to storm damage. The MHZ approved infill. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. No <laughs> we, it's it's hard. It really is hard to to hear that. Thank you. And then I'm very quiet too. That's never <laughs> useful. Sure. So, so I'll start over. 1417 Russell Street is located in the Lachlan Springs Eastern Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The original home was contributing to the district, but was approved for demolition in October of 2020 due to storm damage. The commission approved infill and adado on February 21st, 2021. The permits were issued in March of that year. The, applica the applicant requested revisions, and the permits were revised in July 2021. During an inspection, it was found that the foundation as constructed was too tall and did not match what was permitted. Staff recommended bringing the foundation down by four blocks. The applicant provided a new set of plans that conformed with staff's recommendations. The foundation was brought down by four blocks from the midpoint forward, which also reduced the overall height of the building. The front elevation and stairs, along with the interior floor plan, were adjusted to accommodate the resulting change in foundation and overall height. Again, the left elevation from the midpoint forward reflects the four brick reduction in height. The proposed changes allow the structure to be more compatible and to scale with surrounding buildings on Russell Street. Staff recommends approval of the foundation and ridge heights in the revised plans, finding that, that it meets sections 5A1 of the guidelines for height. Thank you, Kelly. Is the applicant here? Would you like to speak? Sure, good afternoon. My name is Katie Austin and uh, the address is 1417 Russell. I am the manager of our architectural and design team for Legacy South Builders and I just wanted to more or less extend my gratitude to staff because I know it's been a little bit of a journey to get us to this point, but we you know, agree that I think the intentionality of the street view and what we're trying to accomplish and certainly being accommodating for the neighboring home that we're right next to we would want to bring the house down to accommodate their recommendation, which was four blocks. So by doing that, we're almost coming down three feet and uh, we feel really good about these plans with not compromising the value of the home, but also being you know, really intentional in the architectural street view. Thank you so much. Thank you, the commission. Appreciate you working with the staff. Okay, uh, open public hearing. Seeing no one to the podium, we are closing public hearing. Commissioners? Any questions or a motion? 
Uh, Madam Chairman, with respect to 1417 Russell Street, I move for approval uh, with staff conditions. There's a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. None opposed. The motion passes. Uh, in May 2021, a wood sidewall, you see here where the blue arrow is, was installed without a permit on the roof where the building at 316 Broadway abuts 318 Broadway. Around that time, staff was working with the owners of 312 Broadway um, on a similar violation, which you also see here to the right with the palm trees. Uh, the owners of 312 Broadway, however, have withdrawn their application to keep the rooftop wall um, and have agreed to remove that existing wall by September 17th, so this Friday. Uh, the wall at 316 Broadway does not meet section 3.I for rooftop additions, which states that rooftop additions should be stepped back a minimum of 30 feet from the main facade of the building. And the wall appears to be located within 30 feet of the, of the front wall. This case is similar to the wall proposed at Moxie at 215 Broadway, which the commission uh, disapproved in May 2021. Uh, in both cases, staff suggested the use of landscaping features to address the situation. Uh, and the applicant for 312 Broadway, which has agreed to remove their wall, has indicated that that is uh, the solution that, that they plan to use. Um, staff would recommend a similar solution for 316 Broadway. So in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the Woodside Wall, finding that the work does not meet section 3I2 of the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines for additions to existing buildings, and recommends that the violation be removed within 30 days. Thank you, Melissa. Is the applicant here? Applicant is not here. Any other comments from the public? Okay. Close public hearing. Madam Chairman, with respect to 316 Broadway, I uh, move for disapproval of the Woodside Wall, finding that the work does not meet Section 3I2 of the Broadway HPZO design guidelines for additions to existing buildings, and uh, I recommend that the violation be removed within 30 days. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. All in favor? Okay. None opposed? And the motion passes. Thanks for giving me just a second there. This project is one that Councilmember Withers uh, spoke about mm -hmm. earlier in the meeting that is heartbreaking to everybody, including the applicant. Uh, this is a request to demolish 1212 Holly, the East End United Methodist Church that was severely damaged in the tornado. Based on two engineer reports, the building cannot be rehabilitated. It would instead need to be deconstructed and then reconstructed. Whether you're looking at new construction or reconstruction, the cost is in excess of 11 million for a building that's post rehab value is estimated at 506,000. They've exhausted all their potential funding sources and would still be in the red. Immediately after the storm, work was done to protect the building. Prior to the storm, the building was well maintained, so that didn't contribute to the storm damage. Hmm. Staff finds that once the building is reconstructed, there will no longer be a historic building. Reconstruction is cost prohibitive, and the, owners ha um, the owner has not contributed to the issue through any kind of self-imposed hardship. Staff recommends that it is appropriate for the commission to consider economic hardship in this case, and that staff finds the demolition meets 3B2A and section 17.40.420 of the zoning ordinance for the reasons discussed in the report, and the project meets section 3B2B as the extent of work needed will result in a non-historic building. And the applicant is here. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Applicant? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, my Thanks, name is Commissioner. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, my name is Gary Everton. I'm with EOA Architects. We are the architects working on the project. Uh, we have with us not only two people that will speak, but we have some of the other team with us as well. Steve Rutland with uh, Cummins Project Management Team 
and John Madole with American Constructors. In deference to your time for all the pro bono work you folks do, we're going to keep this very short. Robin has done a fabulous job of working with us throughout this project to come up with what we are all heartbroken about. We didn't expect to be here asking for this, mm -hmm. but we are here because we spent the last year and a half trying to save this building. And the bottom line is it's just damaged beyond what we can save economically. So I'd like you to meet the other folks okay. on the team. Thank you, Mr. Everton. I'm Scott Marshall Kimball. I'm the pastor at East End United Methodist Church. Um, Welcome. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you all come up with that okay. I can help with. Sure. Thank you for being here. Uh, and I'm Craig Kennedy, uh, 3700 Brush Hill Road, uh, and uh, attend the church, and I'm on the building committee, uh, also an architect, but, but here to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Thank you. This is your applicant team here. It's your applicant team. This is Mr. Everton. And we're ready to answer any questions yes. if they come up. Um, I agree uh, from chair uh, comments is that the staff has really done a good job in terms of explaining and also to the church for their efforts over the past year. Um, you know, reading the um, recommendation is that their efforts in trying to find ways to get funding um, to try to get some of that um, rehab. Uh, so it's very commendable for the church to try to preserve this. It's a beautiful uh, structure. It still is beautiful. Um, it has a lot of essence still there. Um, will they uh, be able to reuse the, um, the rose window? As a matter of fact, uh Many of the volunteers the day after the tornado carried pieces and parts, and they're stored now at Emanuel Studios. So we've been working with Dennis Harmon on redoing the Good Shepherd window. As Good must, Shepherd. Actually, fabulous concept. We've got enough pieces and parts to keep the Christ figure and the sheep, and everything else is going to be updated to look like a tornado coming through. Wow with the intent of even through the hardest of times, Christ Very is good. still there. Uh, we are going to be salvaging many of the historic pieces, uh, the decorative brick around the archway, uh, a lot of the millwork on the inside. Uh, so there is a salvage portion to the demolition that will occur. Excellent. We may have questions with, for you, but just stand by. Thank you again. Uh, open public hearing. Anyone else would like to speak on this project? Okay. Seeing none, commissioners. Well, um, you know, the, the word that really jumps out to me in reading the staff recommendations and the quotes and the different things is heartbreaking. And it truly is heartbreaking. And I know for the congregation, so much of your heart and soul is tied up in that building. I really applaud your efforts to try to make this work and to try to make it happen. But it's clear from the structural reports and, and the evidence that was presented uh, that this is truly a building that uh, can't be repaired in any reasonable fashion. And uh, so uh, I applaud your efforts to look at rebuilding and, uh, and uh, really support that in every way that we can. So. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, you know, great report coming from staff. Uh, separating uh, actual cost to build sanctuary portion and you know other educational portion and community portion but even though after those you know separating i think it meets uh you know uh, 17 e uh, the demolition is appropriate so it meets uh, number one compare cost of demolition versus cost of uh compliance uh, that will really exceed uh, the cost. And number two, report from licensed engineer with rehab experience. And, you know, it's two walls uh, and two walls and quarter of third wall needed to be removed. To do that, you know, a roof need to be temporarily removed. That means original structure is not there. So that is a really convincing point to me. And also number three, estimate market value. 
I mean, this is a church, but it's really hard, but it's, uh, it's so clear. The cost of you know, rehabilitation, uh, try to rebuild, is really exceed uh, the cost of fair market value. So it's meet that requirement as well. And amount paid, it really doesn't uh, comply because it is 115 years ago. So that value and you know, our fair market value today is no comparison. And number seven, reasonable return to the owners. Uh, you know, that's uh, irrelevant always. And number eight, that's what I really appreciated. Hardship is not self-imposed because of the old relevant picture submitted by uh, church and you know engineer and staff. It is crystal clear they did everything they can do to try to salvage, try to rebuild the building, and you know every time we have to consider demolition, you know it gives pain in our heart. But I'm sure the church members' pain is much much greater than ours. So. With that, I am um, in you know, agreement of staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, I'd just like to applaud the, the church, the applicant, um, all the work that's gone in, you know, looking at, and the staff as well, obviously, but you know, point by point for an application for demolition, again, we take them very seriously. We're getting more and more, it seems, um, uh, you know, either due, the, due to the tornado or just other applicants um, who are requesting to demolish um, structures. And this was just such a, a clean application, so many supportive photographs, you know, the, the reports that we need to see, the estimates that we need to see, um, and just all the information that is requested by us in order to, to look at these cases. And so, you know, I think it is very rare that it seems to be, you know, we're in agreement pretty early in on as we've already, you know, looked at these um, the pa in our packets that, you know, uh, demolition is, is appropriate. And I think that's due to the fact that this was such a, um, a well-done application. And, and again, our hearts go out to everyone affected by the tornado, um, but especially this, this church and the congregation. And, and um, just like Commissioner Johnson said, as hard as it is for us to consider this, it, it's much harder for, I'm sure, everyone um, that attends this church. But so, again, I'm in support of staff recommendation as well. Thank you, Commissioner. No, and I'm in agreement with what all of the other commissioners have said. Um, demolition cases are very hard uh, for us and something that we don't take lightly. Um, as Commissioner Johnson pointed out, we have eight steps or eight points that we go through and, and requirements that we ask uh, to be submitted to consider projects for demolition for economic hardship. And, um, uh, you know, as, as uh, Commissioner Jones said, this, this met, and Commissioner Johnson, th this met all of those points. And, you know, we, we would love to see this building saved, but it, 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 um, it, it truly meets all of those requirements for economic hardship, and we understand why it can't be. And so um, thanks to everybody for their work on this. Yes. And, and then make a motion, and I'll have a comment. With regards to um, 1212 Holly, um, do we need to do this in two steps? I you you move, can pull them together. Um, what's that? You can pull them together. Oh, okay. With regards to 1212 Holly Street, um, I move to... Uh, consider economic hardship in this case, and um, thus considering economic, economic hardship support uh, the staff's recommendation to grant demolition. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Okay, none opposed. Um, just want to make again another chair comment, um, just in our general and I think all the commissioners have, have really said this. I think we understand demolition much better. Um, it is a hard situation that we always come, we have more demolitions that come before us. And just to, again, um, acknowledge the staff and how uh, it's just come the last couple of times because we've had so much demolitions come before us that we can understand it much better and much clearer 
um, so that we can make a decision so when the public also can hear us debate that they are aware that we are serious about demolitions and how the staff is also the staff and the department um, is um, you know very aware of preservation for historic um, structures so just want to have that as public record as well so thank you everyone thank you applicant Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is an application to replace windows on a house that is not historic uh, or non-contributing, as we call it. Uh, the house was built in 2002. On contributing houses in the Germantown overlay, replacing windows is only appropriate when the original windows are unable to be restored, uh, and then only historically appropriate materials would be permitted, which is typically wood, uh, replacement of windows on a non-contributing house is reviewed much like new construction or more like new construction. The house is not historic, therefore the windows are not historic and may be replaced. Uh, and as with new construction, materials other than wood have been approved. Uh, in the language of the design guidelines, contemporary alternatives may also be used if the materials, texture, details, and material color are found to be visually compatible with and similar to or shall not contrast conspicuously with those of adjacent historic buildings. <coughs> uh, we've reviewed many proposed non-wood window selections and at various times have approved several, uh, finding them to be compatible. Uh, some of the things that we look for on, uh, on substitute or alternative materials are uh, there are, I guess, three primary things. One is joining. Uh, historic windows are typically constructed with mortise and tenon joints at the corners, uh, and aluminum and fiberglass clad windows are usually wood windows with a cladding, so they're often made the same way. Uh, they can come with mitered corners, uh, and mitered corners obviously are different than mortise and tenon, but uh, if the corners, the seams are tight, uh, generally those seams are not visible. Um, and those are examples of new construction windows shown there, uh, but wood, a clad window, and even a vinyl window that all have uh, mortise and tenon corners. Uh, most vinyl windows that we've seen are usually made with a fusion welded corner, uh, and that corner seam is more pronounced uh, which staff is, and the commission has found not to be sufficiently compatible. Um, there have been some mortise and tenon windows uh, or construction on vinyl windows, uh, and, and staff has approved uh, at least that one selection uh, shown on the right there. Uh, the second uh, feature is the profile, or what we're calling the profile. Uh, wood windows... Uh, and, and substitute approved clad windows typically have uh, minimal trim consisting of uh, blind stops and casing uh, and the sash. And essentially that's it, that, that's all there is to it, uh, which means that the sash sits inside or sits in a few inches from the wall plane. Uh, and all of those examples uh, shown there have that as well. Many of the vinyl windows that we see um, have uh, just have more elements or, or elements that protrude from from those uh, from those features, uh, which often makes the wall the glass sit forward of the wall or sit flush of the wall, and then that transition is handled with a beveled seam uh, or a beveled transition around the frame, uh, and that's an, another distinction uh, where we see from vinyl and historic windows. Uh, and the third would be sheen or glossiness. Uh, wood windows, of course, are paintable and therefore can take on any color. Uh, paints can be made with many levels of gloss from 
matte and eggshell to semi-gloss or even high gloss. Uh, typically on an exterior paint, you will see something in the eggshell or satin range uh, of glossiness. Uh, aluminum and fiberglass windows uh, are often paintable as well or can have an anodized or uh, embedded color in the material um, and, is, and is there somewhat more comparable to wood. Uh, many of the vinyl windows we see, again, these three here are not in historic overlays, uh, but they're projects currently under construction, uh, and they're not necessarily even the, the brand of window that would be proposed here, uh, but they're just indicative of, of many of the vinyl windows we see. Uh, anyway, sorry, excuse me. Uh, vinyl window, vinyl typically is higher gloss than wood or cladding material and is generally not paintable. Uh, we've approved most aluminum clad windows uh, and uh, more recently we've approved just about uh, most of the uh, fiberglass clad windows options that we've been prevented with and a handful of vinyl windows uh, if the details and characteristics are sufficiently comparable to wood. Uh, the image in, on the right there, uh, as I said, is a uh, construction of a building in the cons it's that's actually in a conservation overlay but uh, a window that has been approved for new construction and preservation districts as well um, the window selection that has been proposed for this house at 409 Taylor Street is a vinyl window uh, that in the sample that we inspected had pronounced mitered corners a raised trim element and a high sheen uh, those are the three elements that we look for that we found was not comparable or compatible as a substitute for wood or, or an approved cladding material. And staff find that they were not a compatible, appropriate substitute. Uh, these are some photographs provided by the applicant of uh, the Window World brand vinyl windows uh, installed on a brick structure, and then two photos installed on a vinyl clad structure. Obviously, uh, vinyl clad is not approved in historic districts, the 409 Taylor Street, I believe, has a hardy cladding. Staff recommends disapproval of the application to install Window World brand vinyl windows, finding them not to be an acceptable substitute for wood windows and not meeting section 3E5I of the design guidelines for the Germantown Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you, Sean. Is the applicant here? I believe they are, yes. Hi, my name is Pam Vaziri, and I am the owner of 409 Taylor Street. And I have a light voice, too. Can you hear me okay? okay yes, thank good. you. <laughs> well, uh, I've never done this before, so if I say something wrong, just I'll try to correct it. Uh, I uh, love this house. I think it's a beautiful house, and I definitely don't want to make it look bad or out of place. Um, the windows that are there now, that was actually listed when we bought the house as a problem with the house. And uh, not only are many of them condescending, or but there's condensation that you can't even see the beautiful view of the city from the back. Um, you can, but it's, it's obscured. Uh, there's also where the two glass panes meet, I guess it's called the seal, Many of them is visibly broken, and you, there's also been water damaged a little bit on the inside. So the windows definitely need replacing. So, and unfortunately, it's most of them, most of them do have wood rot, and a lot of them are very hard to, to open, and some of them I can't even open because of the wood expanding with the water. So the reason why I'm proposing to go to Window World, I know... There's, you know, it's kind of has a maybe a cheapness factor because you see the advertis the advertisements everywhere, but they really are a quality window. I think they're able to keep their price down a little bit. Now, I did get some quotes from other places, and they're not too terribly um, much more, but they are more. The problem is, is that... Uh, 
I don't know their quality. I know Window World quality, and Window World has done two of my homes before, and the window quality is wonderful. Uh, the brick picture that you saw that had uh, some Window World windows, that's actually my parents' house, and those windows are 20 years old. They have not had one problem with them. My windows existing are 20 years old, and they're terrible. Um, they're a little dirty in the, in the picture, but they're functioning. You stand in front of them in the heat. You don't get a heat blast. You don't get a cold blast in the wintertime. The windows currently are that way now. Um, they, they just hold up for 20 years. My parents have had one problem with one window in that 20 years. They called Window World, and they, they fixed them Im immediately. They replaced the window. Uh, they have very good customer service, and Rod's here. His, he's been uh, with me with one other house that we had Window World installed, and uh, we actually got married in that one house, and we broke a window three weeks before our wedding. And Raz here did a rush job. I don't know how he did it in three weeks, but he did it. So he's a very reliable person. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to let Raz speak a little bit about the windows themselves because uh, I know uh, Sean mentioned some of the, the problems or, or things that he saw that maybe don't meet the recommendations. So this is Raz. Thank you. Hello. My name is Rasbik Kohanesiad. Uh, may I put the window up here? Is that okay? <laughs> We're not going to pass it around. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing I did want to mention is even though this is vinyl, it is paintable. Uh, you can paint it any color from Sherman Williams. They sell paint for vinyl windows. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that installation. Uh, if you look at this picture, it's installed uh, with the exterior aluminum trim. And the way we proposed, if you can go back to the original picture, uh, yes. So we're going to keep all that exterior trim work in place, install this window as a new construction window. So that outside trim will remain the same. Now the windows that were uh, on the approved list for new construction already come with that exterior trim attached to the window, which means all this trim will have to be ripped off the house for that new window to be installed with that exterior three and a half inch trim. So by the time we've installed this window, there'll be no aluminum wrap. You would still have that exterior trim around the window. Uh, so the installation will look very similar to this. If the homeowner decides to, they can paint the window any color they'd like. And then the other thing I wanted to uh, point out is I guess one of the other concerns was, uh, it was mentioned our windows have J channels. And as you can see, the J channels are built onto the side of the windows, which they don't. Uh, they were, we were told they have weep holes. These windows do not have weep holes. Uh, and I don't know if uh, the housing authority had seen one of our older windows. Those used to have weep holes, but these windows do not have any weep holes. Uh, and then I guess the other thing I was going to bring up is, yes, the corners are fusion welded. These could be sanded down uh, as smooth as we can get them to, and which we will. We'll send all the corners down. It is airtight, watertight, lifetime transferable warranty. And I guess the other reason why uh, the homeowner brought up price is a lot of the companies out there, the aluminum clad companies, they're well over uh, $2,000 a window. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open public hearing if anyone wants to come to the podium. If not, we will close public hearing. Okay. Uh, this is a tough one because uh, until uh, I hear the applicant, I was actually asked, you know, our staff, uh, you know, Mr. Alexander, because our staff does lots of extensive study and especially windows, you know, update consistently material change. So, uh, you know, Sean's. Uh, reason for not approving this window was uh, very convincing and I thought yes of course we have to follow that but seems like uh, applicant kind of counter <laughs> uh, his reason not to 
um, so maybe I will ask uh, Sean, what, what, can you uh, counter his uh, counter argument, uh, paintable, and like a, what they call like a weave hole? So if you could uh, retaliate those concerns, uh, you know, so if you would educate us on that, that would be great. Uh, I mean, it is, it is, uh, I'm, I'm sort of with you. It's, it, 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 it's, it's not one of those obvious cases necessarily. Uh, it is a, a fine grained detail. Uh, and it's just as the guidelines say that for contemporary materials, uh, we look at the material texture details and material color. Um, and really to be compat and to be compatible with historic materials. Uh, obviously, this is not a historic house, but we're looking for something to be compatible with the materials of historic houses, which is wood. And, um, and you know, Germantown as an overlay has only been in place since 2007 or 8. Um, but historic overlays going back even further would have never had anything other than wood approved, even on new construction. It's one of those things we've been very reluctant to move away from something that's sort of so hard grained uh, traditional um, precedent from the commission is, is, is wood windows. And only, uh, you know, around the time of, just around the time the 2007 when the overlay was created by, uh, excuse me, uh, aluminum clad and, 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 and even a couple years after that fiberglass were finally just being approved, and like you said, it's the the changes in the technology and the manufacture and the materials improved over time, to the point that that those substitutes were uh, nearly indistinguishable. Uh, and only very recently have we ever approved a, a vinyl window, uh, and the first was was the one shown on on the right there uh, by a company called MGM. Um, we staff members went actually to their manufacturing plant in, in I believe it's Hendersonville and saw the production uh, of the window, saw that they were mortise and tenon, uh, so they don't have the pronounced seam, uh, and just some other things about them that staff felt comfortable adding it essentially to the list of new construction approved windows. Um, and we've still been very reluctant to add new vinyl windows to that. We, we're very careful and particular about it because once a window is approved for new construction or re replacement on a non-contributing house, essentially that door is open for that window to be added and, and used elsewhere. So we're just, um, I mean, that's essentially it. We, it, it, it. Once it's approved, it's essentially approved for use anywhere else. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that explanation because that's really important. I mean, you know, applicant did a really good job, but the reason being is we as a historical commission body try to uh, preserve, you know, piece of history. And not only that, you know, if we open up uh, just one material, just a whim, it will open up every single possibility. So for that, I am, um, again, convinced our staff recommendation is the right one. Um, Sean, so what I'm hearing too, that possibly quality for sure is, is our priority as well. Now, if it was this historical structure, we would not be, it, it would be very strict. Um, so the, your, your assessment is, not only because it's not on our list, per se, or has been proven uh, through experience of the staff and, and their, you know, assessment of how it's made. So were you informed by Window World how, you know, any more specific questions on their specifications? Uh, am, I, am I getting off? point or I'll see if I I'll, I'll see if I can answer that um, well first you're correct that for a historic house uh, we're still would not approve a, a replacement right uh, although on a rear perhaps or or you know sometimes a, a an elevation that's not really visible maybe anyway that's a different different situation um, 
for I, I, um, in the past, uh, certainly the, the durability of vinyl windows has been a question. Uh, and one of the things that has prevented this commission and other commissions from approving vinyl windows, um, you know, it's hard to, it's certainly I would think that the windows, vinyl windows from 20 years ago obviously are needing to be replaced. Um, I assume it's safe to say that the construction has improved and that the durability is likely to be better, but it's, it's, it's not predictable. Another advantage, at least of wood windows, is they're repairable, whereas vinyl, typically, if there's a, an issue, the window needs to be replaced. Quality and, and durability are, are important issues, but our main issue is, is the appearance. So while I, you know, I certainly think that you know, Window World is, is, certainly appears to be a good company with, with great customer service and all those things are commendable, um, they're sort of outside of our purview. We're just looking at, at what the window looks like. Okay. And, and then it's vinyl. Okay. So, so um, one of the things that wasn't discussed, um, but that is part of the guidelines, is the, uh, is the muttons on the windows. And I know that the windows that are proposed in the application and the sample both have internal muttons, and the guidelines require that there be not only a spacer in between, but adhered muttons on the outside and the inside. Uh, so that's one of the, the criteria that, from an appearance standpoint, a lot of people don't notice what the corners look like and that kind of stuff, but virtually anybody that walks down the street sees, you know, that if it's just a flat piece of glass with fake muttons on the inside or in between the glass. So uh, I guess that's one of the questions that I have. And, uh, and then the, the other question I guess I have is on the existing house, it appears that there, there are more... Uh, large panes without many muttons in there. So uh, so can you talk a little bit about muttons and what then, and I guess this is both for the applicant and for the, uh, and for Sean, mm -hmm. so. I think that may be a, I'll let the, the applicant answer. I think that that's more of a preference issue, at least for this case. And if there are any follow-ups, I'll see if I can jump in. So, uh, on Taylor, there's no muttons, grids, so we're going back with no grids. And I can assure you, as far as quality, durability, we're one of the only few companies that give you a true lifetime warranty where most of our competitors is a 20-year warranty. Uh, was there something else? That... Yeah, and, and the main reason for these vinyl windows now which has improved over the years, is very well insulated, zero maintenance. And as far as installation, and I, I know we keep going back to historical, um, this house, I guess, is in a historical area, but it's built 2006, sure. uh, which I guess we're allowed to do vinyl windows, and I'm very familiar with MGM windows. And these windows, I can assure you, are very similar to MGM windows, and it is a lower uh, profile than the MGM windows, which I've gone up against them several times. But insulation factor, maintenance factor, these windows are designed for life. Thank the you. company that makes them has been around since 1946. Okay. Uh, that, that explains the mutton question. Thanks. Thank Sean, anything else on that? No, well, uh, yes, the house is 2002. Uh, it was before the overlay, so this wasn't one where the Historic Zoning Commission would have reviewed it. Uh, it was in an MDHA overlay at the time, and, and um, we, we asked that they, they did not have a record of, of what was approved uh, at that time. I guess my other comment would be is that we're probably going to have some more of these as these houses get older and they're non-historic. So... Uh, you know, to be, to be prepared for a next project for us to be, I mean, we're, we're deliberating this because it's going to come back on us again. So I think it's just really clear, you know, for us to understand why, especially it's, a, it's historic Germantown. So that has a little bit stricter uh, guidelines as well. Um, and again, that little balance is because this house is non-contributing and we're, you know, making it to guidelines of um, 
historic preservation. Yeah, comment. No, I'd like to hear what it, Sarah, with the comment on the muttons, what are you? Yeah. No, I wasn't clear on that either. Thinking now, just in your thoughts. You know, I mean, just with, you know, again, I, I agree with Commissioner Johnson on, you know, potentially opening a, a door to things, but is, you know, for certain situations, if it is a, a new product that might be approved, you know, these are kind of the detail things that I would appreciate, you know, Cyril and Lee's kind of input on. Yeah. Sure. I, I think and to clarify what my point was, that is that it really is about appearance. I mean, that's that's what these guidelines are about. And uh, and certainly we, we don't, you know, we want things to be quality and well done, but that's not the overriding criteria. And so, um, and so one of the things that the guidelines say is that uh, it talks about the muttons and it does not allow for the internal muttons that aren't expressed on the outside. It does say uh, that single light, also known as one over one window sashes, are appropriate for new construction. And this is not new construction, but it's reasonably new construction, and that's what was in that, that house that's being replaced. So I think there's a reasonable, reasonable argument for that. Um, and uh, I, I guess my sense is that it seems like we can get to what the guidelines require with this window unit with some modifications to it. And so, for instance, if it's paintable, you know, it doesn't need to have the sheen, uh, it shouldn't have sashes, you know, uh, internal muttons on it, and, uh, and clear glass and the four inch casing around it. Th those are the criteria that are primarily in the guidelines for this. Maybe we should make that part of that motion. Um, <laughs> if I can make Sorry. a comment real quick. Um, I guess this is hard. We, we have so many windows that staff has like vetted and gone through to make sure that they comply with the guidelines and introducing a new window to that is not, I mean, that's something we should be open to doing um, when that window has been fully vetted. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not 100% convinced. It's like having written specifications in my past. I know we're not looking at quality, but the quality does affect the appearance. So I think we have to look at quality from that standpoint. And so, you know, having the seams at the corners does kind of still bother me. And I feel like we could approve it, but I'm not sure, you know, like we haven't, I wish they had submitted, you know, not that it would have meant anything to, to everyone here, but, you know, I wish there had been like, uh, you know, the drawings of the windows submitted and the specs of the windows submitted to have some point of yes. comparison to the other windows that we have approved. So that's yeah. just my yeah. thoughts. I, I think that's good general conversation too for, for the staff to, um, you know, for future. That's great. It's a good comment. Okay, <laughs> we've had a long conversation about Mullins and Muttons and, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I can make a motion, but I feel like what I'm saying is different than most of the rest of the commission. Or uh, well, our recommendation summary is either we disapprove of this application to install Window World. <laughs> well. That, that's that's our. I mean, I'll just. What I'm thinking is, you know, uh, you know, I guess I'm just not sure to say yes about it. You know, so in that case, gives me pause. Just like Commissioner Fitz, um, you know, I think the I think it was the applicant or someone brought up the fact that the you know the the trim could remain and that, and then it, you know the window would just be put in and that. I thought was oh okay, well then that would. The, yeah, the trim's going to stay. Yeah, the, the, it's going to stay, and then it's just going in, you know, on the inside. Um, but then again, the points that you bring up, Lee, you know, bring me back to, oh, but then this might be opening the door for, you know, I don't want to have to specifically design every home's window, you know, from every piece of a different manufacturer's window specs, like, oh, no, we can't do these three things out of these eight things, and that's just, it might be a little too much. Um, so I, I'm kind of... You know, with all the different pieces of it and, um, you know, not being a designer, uh, you know, it is difficult to kind of envision the differences between one and the other for me. Um, so I'm, so I guess uh, I'm going in between, to be honest, of um, not a little bit hesitant to just have this 
as a okay, yes, we you know this is a good window that we're going to now approve, maybe you know not forever, but and then going between well, it, you know, yes, it might look good on this particular house, you know, for reason X Y Z. So, so let me try something, and Robin, you can tell me if this is right. out of line or not. So. So my sense is uh, we've got the guidelines and we have a way to get there with the proposed windows, uh, but it could be a contingent upon a review of the specifications and details of those windows uh, by the staff. Would that be appropriate? Anything you want to do is appropriate. Um, <laughs> you haven't told me that I before. agree with, <laughs> well, you know. Um, okay. I agree with Commissioner Jones, though, that it it's already a little problematic if we say we have a window that meets everything, but they're mutton stone. And so trying to keep track of are they using them on that particular one or not, it, it does get a little problematic. And we do have a two-page list of windows that have been approved that mm -hmm. could be chosen. And, and, Sean, you've talked to the applicant about those options, correct? Uh, yeah, somewhat. Uh, we provided the list, and I mean, it's not a, it's just a, a running list of windows that have been approved. It's, um, but, we, but it's been we do discussion add to it advocate. or try to update, keep it up to date as, as much as possible. But as I think Commissioner Johnson said, the, the, and still the availability of windows on the market changes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. Sorry, Sean. Keep going. Yes, uh, I sent the list and, and I was available for questions and I think she, uh, the, the applicant looked at some other options on the list, but um, obviously they're loyal to the, the window world brand. Make a motion. No? Okay. Anybody brave enough to make the motion? So let me uh, try. <laughs> so we approve this window wall in this specific uh, location, considering a house is new or built, with working with staff uh, to confirm it meets design guideline. And so if it does not meet design guideline, uh, may have to disapprove. So it's conditional approve. Would that be appropriate? Well. Yes. The okay. recommendation is disapproval of the application. We felt it didn't meet the guidelines. So, so. it doesn't meet the guidelines currently. Recommended. Okay. So I, I'm hearing you. I think that that's kind of what you're saying. But yeah. Instead I, of flat out, uh, you know, disapprove it, just uh, recommend approval with condition of meet all other uh, guidelines. Or if it does not meet, <laughs> you know, I can go to disapprove it. I mean, we think now it doesn't meet. The, okay. It's not a, I'm not sure, Sean Jumpin, what could really be done to change that. Your recommendation, you mean? <laughs> yeah. No, to change the window. Oh, to I mean, change you know, the window. Well, it's, it's a little bit different than maybe a house where they can change the height to make it, you know, it, it is what it is. And our assessment is that it doesn't meet the guidelines. Right. You may find that it does, though, of course. But I, I don't know that there's anything to be gained by um, putting it back on staff to make it meet the guidelines. Understood. Yeah. You, Commissioner, is that clear? Retract the motion. <laughs> okay. Well, you could make the motion. Or legal, if she said that, then it, we could see how they vote. And Yeah, they could, they could, you could come to that decision. If, that, if you want to keep the motion, but under, I hear you're withdrawing the motion. Yes. So, it's yeah, okay. I withdraw okay. with the motion to come up with a better motion. I mean, I think just the applicant has heard our conversation, our discussions. Um, they should be clear on how we're debating it. So, let's vote, and then it would be up to the applicant to continue discussion with the staff. They want, if they want to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let, let me try. Let me try this. Uh, <laughs> with respect to 409 Taylor Street, uh, I move that we uh, approve 
the applicant uh, window world brand vinyl windows with the conditions that they have clear glass that is not tinted and not coated and that it has no muttons in the windows, that the wells be flush and that it has four inch casings around the windows and it be painted with a non-gloss paint uh, and that the specification should be submitted to the staff for uh, review and approval uh, only for this uh, quote new construction project uh, and not for historic homes. There is a motion on the floor. Second. There is a second on the floor. All in favor of the motion. Any opposed? Okay, none opposed. So that motion passes with the terms and conditions. Thank you. Okay. Next up is 1500 Holly Street. This is an application for the construction of a DADU at 1500 Holly Street. The commission approved infill for this lot back in July. The proposed DADU meets the design guidelines for massing, form, siting, and setbacks. With staff approval of the final selections, it will also meet the design guidelines for materials. The one issue is this add-on feature. The applicant intended for this feature to meet the guidelines for the add-on Oriel feature. Here are the guidelines for projecting Oriel. The proposed feature is not deeper than two feet. It's not taller than 10 feet in wall height as illustrated in the diagram. It is no wider than 10 feet and there is only one on the building. So it does comply with the conditions that are listed here. However, the diagram shows the Oriel on the ground level and the applicant is proposing it cantilevered. Staff's interpretation of the guidelines is that projecting Oriel add-ons were intended to be at the ground level. Thus, staff finds that this feature does not meet the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval with the following conditions. The cantilevered Oriel feature shall be removed and staff shall approve the final siding, trim, material, the windows, doors, and garage doors prior to purchase and installation, finding that the project will meet section four and seven of the design guidelines. Thank you, Jenny. Applicant? Hello, uh, I'm Craig Kennedy, 3700 Brush Hill Road. Um, Jenny, did, did uh, yeah, oh, okay, great. Um, thank you for uh, uh, letting us uh, speak here. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, I actually worked with Robin and the staff uh, in the design guideline consolidation and the, the outbuilding uh, changes over, I guess it would have been 2019 or so. Uh, and when we got the uh, sort of updates to the guidelines a few months ago, sort of in the office, we're uh, going through and looking at the extensions or the, the add-ons and, and sort of excited about the opportunity. Uh, many of them created an, an Oriole, uh, sort of to be in sort of full honesty, we all kind of had to dust off our uh, architectural history books and, and sort of look up what is an oral? You know, we, we sort of looked at the diagram. We were like, what is an oral? Uh, so I, our um, sort of main sort of thing in here today is just to sort of discuss, you know, what is, I know we're sort of seeing some of the first um, applications on a lot of these extensions and sort of how they'll be uh, set up kind of from, from here out uh, in, in sort of definition of, of what the elements are. But uh, in... Um, the book that, that we have in the office, it's uh, probably one of the history books we all sort of looked at in, in school, but uh, definition of Oriel says C, bay window. Bay window says, uh, and uh, I can't read that far away, but it says an, an angular or curved projection of a house, front filled uh, by fenestration, if curved, also called a bay window, if on an upper level only, called an Oriel or Oriel window. Um, so that's that's sort of how we interpreted it um, and, you know, not in sort of exhaustive Internet research, but uh, sort of the top two, I don't know if I have a pointer, but the top two inches are sort of more historic uh, looking features. But but it was 
you know, in some cases on an upper story wall, and in some cases, you know, breaks uh, roof plane. Uh, and then in our case, uh, sort of presenting a, maybe a little bit more contemporary take on it uh, is probably more similar uh, to uh, maybe the bottom three images. Um, so I, I think really today we were just kind of interested in having some discussion of of Oriel kind of definition and then how it maybe gets applied as we, you know, continue on uh, utilizing these, these guidelines. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Open public hearing. Okay, close public hearing. Okay, let me, uh, basic question. Uh, so according to the new design guidelines, the, they are depicting an Oriole as just kind of being a jut out on the ground floor of a building, it, like, is that what I'm looking at on this, that little thing coming out? Yes. Under the roof? That, that's, this okay. is, this is then, exactly what's in the guidelines. Okay, sure. And then <laughs> the, the um, applicant is arguing that an Oriole is more like, and what he would prefer on his, what he has designed on this structure, is more like a, like a bay window that crosses the roof plane to the wall, kind of? This, this is what they're proposing yeah. for that Oriole, but yes. That's, so I think, yes. Kind of, I mean, it's just not completely on the roof, so therefore it's called an Oriole. <laughs> it, well, it's definitely not a dormer, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, dormer, that's what I'm... Whatever. And that was their intention, was for it to be an Oriole. Um, okay. And that was, you know, we kind of had the conversation back and forth with them. Um, you know, the guidelines are showing it on the ground. They point out, historically, an Oriole is cantilevered. Um, so really, we wanted some direction from you that this is not the first applicant who has asked for this feature. Um, so we wanted to take it to you and and get some feedback so we have something consistent to tell people going forward. Okay. So, yeah, I just, I mean, I would say just we kind of have to see, you know, opposed to what the actual definition of an Oriole is or not, however we're using it is kind of... Or, the discussion I think should be what we think is appropriate and where we think it should be. Again, you know, that applicant is looking for guidance, so is staff. Um, so I'd like to hear other people's thoughts on it. My, I guess, my thoughts on that. I know when I think of an Oriole, whether it's the proper, correct definition or not, I think of that projecting um, element or window happening on the flat face of a building below a roof line, but above the ground. Um, again, I don't know if that's the proper definition or not. When I look at these images, I guess what concerns me, I, I like the design. It's not that I don't like the design. I like the design. What concerns me is that it looks like a dormer that has projected past the face of the house. And we have strict definitions about where that a dormer has to, you know, how far back a dormer has to um, stop or be in line with the with the wall of the house below, or in some cases be inset. And this looks like a dormer that's projected past the face of the house, and so that's what concerns me in the historical context. So, so I just, since there is some confusion on this, I went to the <laughs> Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> And the Oxford Dictionary says a projection from the wall of a building typically supported from the ground are the corbels. Now, I, I think that, you know, these elements have a place on a lot of the buildings, especially the more modern style buildings. But, uh, and, and I don't think, based on this definition, it has to go to the ground. But the thing I do say is that from this definition, it's a projection from the wall of a building not from the roof. And so I tend to agree uh, with Commissioner Fitz that, you know, this appears to be a dormer that sort of slipped down. And uh, so, so I think that, that to me would, would be a more acceptable interpretation of, of what the guidelines are. I can see, you know, not sitting on the ground, but above ground, just interpretation of 10 feet wide, 10 feet tall, 2 feet uh, in depth. So if you take a look at only that portion, I can see it not necessarily, you know, uh, flush to the ground, like uh, bay window, or, you know, in the depicted. 
but in this picture, it's not 10 feet wide, uh, 10 feet tall on the window, but roof point is, uh, I want to say, like a, about 12 feet. So it's not meeting the guideline. So, you know, if it's meeting the guideline, like a window, typical sticking out, you know, and, and then only one side, because guideline is specific, not two, but one of those 10 by 10 by two will be appropriate. That's vaguely guideline says. So somebody want to interpret as a, you know, bay window sitting above the ground, I can see that. But uh, just strict interpretation of the guideline and the dimension, I don't think this particular design meet that guideline. I agree. And just what Commissioner Fitz said, it, it, you know, why would we for, why would we, why would anyone have a two foot, you know, inset for the for a dormer if they could just bring it down the wall. So I guess that, you know, use of the term or the definition or not, I don't think that was the spirit of, and that's not what's depicted in the design guidelines. Um, therefore, regarding 1500 Holly Street, I uh, move for approval um, of the new outbuilding DADU with all staff uh, conditions. Okay, there's a motion. Second. Second, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? None, so the motion carries. Thank you. Good, good discussion. Now we all know what an Oriole is, right? Um, since we have just a second, are you commissioners good? We've been on, on point for two hours. Do we need a break? Good. Okay. Let's keep going. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is an application for partial demolition and new construction of an addition at 1627 Fatherland Street. The scope includes removal of non-contributing portions of the building, a non-historic carport, a non-historic rear addition, and an original rear dormer. The rear dormer is historic, but because it is at the rear, its removal does not impact the character of the house as it's viewed from the front. Uh, following the partial demolition, the proposal is to construct a new rear addition with a first story component and a new rear dormer, a larger rear dormer. Both components of the addition are appropriately scaled, appropriately located, and clad with appropriate exterior materials uh, with, of course, a condition that the window and door selections are approved. Um, the proposal also includes replacing the original wood siding with cement fiber clapboard. Oh, that's the rear elevation. Uh, with rear, with uh, cement fiber clapboard. Siding contributes as a major component of a building's appearance generally for all houses, but this siding is particularly significant because of its narrow reveal and a beaded edge at the bottom of each board. Staff visited the property to examine the siding and found it did have areas of deterioration and has some loose or broken boards and other places where repair is necessary. But overall, staff found the siding to be in good condition. Uh, replacing wood siding is an action that is now reviewed in the neighborhood conservation zoning overlay under the adopted, uh, the new guidelines that were adopted in April and went into effect in May of this year. Uh, and I believe this is the first time the commission has reviewed an application to replace siding under the new guidelines. Uh, of course, the, those guidelines or similar guideline has been in place for preservation overlays, uh, but removal of siding applications are, are rather few and far between there. Uh, again, this is the first one in conservation overlay. Staff finds that replacing the distinctive original wood siding would diminish the historic character of the building. Staff 
recommends approval of the proposed addition with the following conditions, that the original siding is to be retained, deteriorated portions may be repaired, and sections beyond repair may be replaced uh, with their specific approval. Uh, the partial demolition should be accomplished manually. Um, window and door selections shall be approved prior to installation. Uh, the HVAC units are located on the rear or on the side facade beyond the midpoint of the house. And the location of utility meters and mechanicals shall be reviewed prior to sign off on building permits if they are located uh, anywhere forward of the midpoint of the house. Meeting those conditions, staff finds that the application meets a proposal for the Lachlan Springs design uh, conservation overlay. Thank you, Sean. Applicant? The applicant is here, and they have some slides that I'll pull up. I have some printouts as well to pass around. Yeah, one is an engineering report, and the other is a PowerPoint slide we'll be presenting. Thank you so much. Was that engineer report in our packet? G give me just one moment, applicant. Sure. Is this new information? I haven't seen it. I have not seen it, but it sounds like it's just um, further clarification of their request. Okay. When he said engineer report, it this is something I developed on my own. Uh, not. I'm not an engineer. I hired an engineer for the report. Okay. I'm sorry. We just wanted clarification on that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Forrest Gray. Uh, I am a contractor licensed in the state of Tennessee. Uh, I come to you, though, as a homeowner and Lachlan Springs neighbor. Um, my wife and I have been looking for years for a home, and I think everybody here knows how difficult that is right now in Nashville. We were fortunate enough to uh, buy 1627 Fatherland Street. Um, it's not anything that we're planning on flipping. We want to live here for years. We want to keep the house uh, in our family for forever. And so this is something that, again, I'm coming to you uh, as the homeowner. Um, obviously, there's some siding in question. You can go ahead and go to the next slide, and uh, I'll try to stick to the 10 minutes the best that I possibly can. Um, <clears throat> so as Sean explained, the siding in question is on the front, uh, basically the front part of the house, but we do have three distinct types of siding on the home currently. So you've got the original wood siding in question. Uh, you've also got new wood siding located uh, and denoted by that yellow line on a previous edition that was many years ago. Uh, and then finally, an orange line, which signifies vinyl that is currently on the house. So we've got kind of like a Frankenstein <coughs> siding situation going on. Um, I estimate that the historical siding in question represents about 60 to 65% uh, of the exterior cladding currently on the home. The current state of the existing siding. So the siding in question uh, in my opinion, and the engineer's opinion, uh, is that it's in general disrepair. Uh, because the siding is so old, uh, the house is literally 100 years old, uh, is extremely brittle, and splinters incredibly easy. There's evidence on about 80 to 90 percent of that siding that water is penetrating through the lap siding, uh, and many of the attaching nails are completely rusted and failing. The painted exterior of the siding is chipped, peeling, or flaking in 90 to 95 percent of the existing siding. Um, and obviously my main concern is that the siding does not protect the home from outside elements, pests, or water intrusion, and it lacks any structural sheathing uh, and does not have a vapor barrier. Because I've not been able to remove the siding, the exterior state of the framing is also unknown. Uh, additionally, the fascia and soffit are also degraded and in need of replacement. Um, and then the next few slides just show a few examples of kind of what I'm seeing and hoping to show you guys today. So starting from left to right, um, obviously you can see kind of a zoomed in section of the home. I will say I took about 80 pictures uh, to save everybody's time here. I, I limited those significantly to about 12 of the exterior 
and the same amount for the interior. Uh, these are all across the board. They're not in one section of the home. Uh, so this is actually occurring uh, all the way around on all three sides that I was showing you earlier in the diagram. Uh, you can see the paint chipping. Um, there's some evidence of water intrusion getting behind that paint, degrading it, um, and, and again, kind of delaminating it away from the substrate. You can also see in the second picture, at one point it looks like they may have covered up a door, and instead of um, using proper, proper craftsmanship, they kind of just made straight lines down, stuck in those boards, painted it, and walked away. Uh, the problem is that every single one of those butt joints, um, you, you're having gaps, you're having air coming in, water coming in, pests coming in, et cetera. Um, the third picture uh, or from the left uh, kind of shows in, again, a different area of the house, but a zoomed in section of the siding. You can see uh, years of painting and partial scraping uh, and, and just general neglect to the exterior facade of this home. And then the fourth picture shows uh, some of those rusted nails that I was talking about. The issue with these nails is that the pan head of the nail is actually completely deteriorated and gone. Um, that's important because this siding would easily just be able to pull right off the, the exterior structure. Um, so again, just a lack of structural integrity. Um, on the next slide, you've got more evidence uh, of degradation of the wood siding in question. Um, almost all of these lap, side, uh, lap siding pieces are separated and have roughly a sixteenth of an inch gap um, that allows, again, water, air, pests, uh, and everything else through. Um, won't need to highlight anything other than just showing you these pictures in, in various locations around the house. And thankfully for uh, earlier, too, learning what an Oriole was, that fourth picture on the right there is an Oriole. Um, and, and it's actually in some of the worst uh, state of the whole house. It's uh, extended water intrusion has rotted out not only the framing, but the trim and the siding. The next slide kind of echoes the issues with the trim, specifically on the Oriole. So you've got a zoomed in picture of the left side. You've got a zoomed out picture of the right side. Uh, if you look carefully on that second picture, you can see the water intrusion coming from the gutter behind the fascia and rotting out that entire side. Um, the third picture from the left shows a zoomed in portion of uh, trim that is actually under a carport. So this has been protected for years um, and is still degraded. You can see the, the paint chipping away um, and, and overall the, the trim in, in a relatively bad state. And then finally, that fourth picture uh, shows you the soffit. Uh, they have piecemealed this thing together using a combination of beadboard uh, paneling, it looks like, and then maybe some plywood. Um, if you look very carefully, you can see towards the corner where there is water intrusion, uh, degradation of the soffit, and overall splintering of that wood, and then some, uh, some holes there where pests can get in. Um, on the next slide, we move to the interior of the home. Uh, I think this is the most important for the siding. Um, as we started removing the plaster and lath from the interior of the home, uh, it became very evident that there is extended water damage happening in almost every piece of the siding. Uh, you can see the water coming through in between all of the slats. Um, this is especially concerning because of the electrical system that would be living in a relatively humid and uh, vapor-rich environment, if you will, um, and you can see that on the far left picture where those light switches are. That's actually just to the right of the front door and under a covered porch, which is about eight feet deep. So again, you're having moisture coming in in areas that should ultimately be protected even by other um, features of the home. If we keep moving, uh, kind of get into the gaps around the home. Again, I just want to emphasize that these are not in one area. This is consistent throughout the home on all three sides for that original wood siding. Um, you can see the daylight kind of protruding through every single piece uh, of the siding, or at least in, in many of them. Um, I want to call your attention to the far right. You can see where somebody at some point had, uh, again, tried to splice in some newer material to match the old. Uh, and I want to point out that there's water staining even on the newer material. Um, and, and that's just inevitable with this type of siding. Um, the next slide echoes, again, all the same things that we've been talking about, gaps, 
uh, below and above windows um, in the general exterior cladding. Uh, none of the windows have a proper header. This is something else that, that I would love to update and, and bring this house up to be structurally stable. Um, that's impossible to do or re really pretty difficult to do without removing the exterior siding. Um, and then finally, um, then on the next slide, I want to kind of give you just the highlights of the engineering report so I don't bog you down with too much information. But a quote from his report. In addition, the structure's lack of a functional lateral resisting system is of major concern given that the tornadoes that hit East Nashville and many other areas in Middle Tennessee in March of 2020 had completely destroyed similar historic homes throughout the neighborhood. There are missing sections of siding that allow pest and rodent intrusion. You've seen evidence of that. There are several areas of exterior siding that show damage and buckling due to water intrusion. You've also seen that. Uh, one thing that he notes that I haven't yet is the significant amount of dry rot that exists in this siding as well. That causes the brittle nature of the siding as well as the cracking uh, that you're seeing kind of throughout. The majority of the structure does not have any weather weatherproofing. So the back half where there's vinyl uh, and the newer wood siding that actually does have vapor barrier. Um, however, the front half of the house does not, uh, which is obviously a major concern. Um, and then finally, there is currently no adequate lateral resisting system to support the structure. Uh, that siding does not provide any structural support whatsoever. The house did not contain anchor bolts in the foundation, structural wall sheathing on the exterior walls, or structural connectors to attach the roof to exterior walls known as hurricane ties. Installation of adequate lateral resisting system is required to prevent structural collapse in the case of a high wind event, which we are very familiar with in East Nashville. Uh, in summary of his report, he says, I recommend upgrading the lateral resisting system of the structure. This would include installing structural sheathing on the exterior of the perimeter walls, installing anchor bolts in the foundation and structural connectors between the exterior roof, uh, or between the roof and the exterior walls. All termite damage and dry rot and other damage framing to be replaced, adequate waterproofing to be installed to protect the structure, replace the exterior siding to meet historic standards and recommendations to have the exterior siding be uniform. I think that's important because I do know um, that Historic does accept fiber cement uh, in certain guidelines. Mr. Gray, your 10 minutes. Okay, can I just give you two quick points? Okay. I appreciate the leniency, thank you. Um, one board of six and a quarter fiber cement lap siding is approximately $7 right now. That works out to be about $1.40 a square foot. One custom milled 12 foot board of poplar lap siding is $5.50 a linear foot. That works out to be about $13.20. I understand the charge of this committee. I respect it tremendously. It's extremely important to me to preserve the building. And I think that we shouldn't give precedent to one material. I am very interested in preserving this building for as, as long as I possibly can. And the way to do that is to provide sheathing, a vapor barrier, and new siding. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I do have a question, Mr. Gray. Um, yes, sir. So if you put sheathing, some of the pictures did show the window trim, and it showed that the existing siding comes right out to the edge of that window trim. If you put sheathing on uh, and you put on you know, a house wrap and then you put on your siding, yes, sir. Uh, are you planning on bringing those window trims out so yeah. that they yes, will sir. be uh, in, in proper In the portion? notes, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. To bring that out where they'll be in proper proportion and project beyond the siding? Absolutely. Yeah, we're planning on replacing the windows uh, in their exact dimensions and scope and in terms of all the munions and, and everything. So 100% yes. Okay. Restoration is the ultimate goal. Thank you. We may have more questions, but thank, thank you. Thank you. I'll stand by. Okay. Uh, anyone in the public that would like to make a comment? Seeing none, we're going to close public hearing. Well, I understand that, you know, the, as we've discovered in other cases and things in the past that kind of caused us to uh, bring that into our purview under the consolidation, um, you know, I think I've been swayed uh, by the applicant's presentation for the need for, for a little extra TLC um, for, for this house. Um, so that's, that's where I am. You know, historically, these homes were not insulated when they were built. 
and they were actually designed so that those walls would breathe, knowing that caulking is not a permanent solution and that with lap siding you do get some water in there. So they, they were designed so that they would dry out after some water came in. Uh, as we go back in and we fill those wall cavities with insulation and all, then it, it does tend to destroy that old system of ventilation that tended to work. And so um, I, I tend to agree that uh, having had similar situations, it's, uh, it's very hard to go in and try to bring that wall up to today's standards uh, with, without some sort of vapor barrier, without some sort of way of, of protecting that. I hate to see the, the uh, beautiful siding go away uh, because it really is a character defining element of the house and, and I agree with the staff on that. But given the evidence that been, that's been presented today, I, I tend to agree with uh, Commissioner Jones. Yeah, I, I hate um, I hate to see this historic siding go, but um, I am extremely compelled by the applicants, um, the by the information that he's provided. It is it is very thorough, and I feel like it really tells the story of what's happening here um, with the exterior of this home. And while I would prefer to see the siding remain, uh, it it. it uh, is really difficult. I mean, it, it's going to be difficult to do that and to waterproof this home and properly insulate this home and, and to actually preserve the siding. Um, it, it's, it seems like it's a almost impossible task. Um, so I, I um, agree with Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Stewart. Thank you. Yeah, I struggle with this one <laughs> because knowing, you know, the reason for the guideline update is if we remove everything, you know, uh, the siding, it would just leave the skeleton. So what's the purpose of preservation? Mm -hmm. So that is the, my main, you know, dilemma. But I understand, you know, if we, you know, new owner try to be, uh, take care of the house and try to be livable, something has to be done to upgrade to the standard. So, yeah, I'm really torn this one. I <laughs> understand because if, especially this one, you know, the milled uh, siding is a, you know, character defining feature, but at the same time, you know, can we force uh, the applicant to, you know, spend 10 times more to restore and also, maybe never completely waterproofing, it's I impossible. So yes, I, I continue to struggle. <laughs> Madam Chairman, with respect to 1627 Fatherland, I move for approval of the proposed addition with the conditions that the staff outlined in their recommendation, uh, but with the additional condition that the original wood siding may be replaced with materials uh, to be reviewed by staff, including not only the material and specifications, but also the dimension of the lap and detailing around windows um, and uh, to be within conformance with the guidelines. Thank you, Vice Chair. A second. There's a second. All in favor of the motion, please say or raise your hand. I want to make sure we've got, raise your hand. So we'll, those in, okay. Three. And those opposed? Okay. There is one opposed. No, no. Oh, yes. Oh, right. Okay. I will also oppose. It's difficult, but. Motion does not pass, so you can make another one or. So we're two and two. Was that three? They were three and two. Oh, so we have to have four. Please. Yeah, if you um, you could always move to defer. That, that's usually what happens when you come to a deadlock is sometimes they'll defer it and keep to advise to keep working on it. But right now you don't have enough to, it looks like to pass it away. Scratch that, I forgot about your 30-day operation of law clause. Too many commissions. 
<laughs> so yeah, within even if you deferred it, it, you'd have an operation of law clause that would make it deemed passed. So you'll need to either make them get it for people to get on board with something, mm -hmm. or it's going to pass automatically. Right. You want to talk about it some more? It is difficult. Um, you know, you see the design. I mean, you know, again, applicant, you'll just hear us. What you did a very good presentation, please. Um, and again, it is because that we've seen so many houses that are skeleton, you know, in these historic places. It, it just, you know, it's sort of like, what, what's the point? Um, there's such a good detail of the of the older siding because you've got that one that's in between almost the line, and then you know, cause so the, so then you lose that character. Um, and I think that's what uh, Commissioner Johnson and I uh, sort of concur on. But also, it is 2021. It was built in 1910, and um, we struggle with those bringing it up to up to par um, today. And we we do appreciate that you want to be, you know, want to preserve the house and um, bring it back to as similar of materials that you can. Um, and Madam Chair, if I may, just to just yes, to be please. clear, if you don't get a motion and it does pass by operation of law, it would be passed without any conditions. Gotcha. Just a warning. Without any conditions of the recommendation, you mean? It would be passed as applied for. So that none of the recommendations of staff here would be approved. So it would be just passed as the whatever they applied for if you didn't have a motion passed and it passed by operation of law. Does that make sense? Do we understand that? So in that case, uh, Mr. Dickerson, uh, I'm the prevailing side. Could I make a motion to reconsider? Or does it have to be come from the other commissioners? Or you have to have um, another motion. Let me look at let me look that up. Give me two seconds. Okay. Okay. May I make a quick comment? I, I, I think I think we do understand. No, I was just gonna say I don't disagree with anything. Sure. We, I think we yes. Sure. I I think the commission is clear on your intentions. I think it's just us wavering on. It, it's a it's a new um, discussion for us. This is the first time with the new design consolidation. So, you know, give us a moment. <laughs> yeah. Are you looking to make the exact same motion, or are you looking to modify in any way? Or, because a, a new motion modified in any way would be, just be a new motion, as opposed to having the same motion deliberated again. How would she term that? <laughs> I, I am thinking about exact same motion, so that's the motion to reconsider because I am changing my Preference. Okay, there's a, a mechanism in your rules that says the affirmative vote of four members of the majority is necessary to grant a rehearing. Um, I'd recommend you just use that method, grant a rehearing, and you don't have to go through the through the process again because you've heard it. And you're essentially rehearing the same thing, so you can consider the same motion that way. So if you want to do that, you could take a motion to grant a rehearing on the issue now, and then re re uh, post the same motion. motion. Yeah. Okay, so I took a motion to rehearing. So do, we can. Do we have to make a motion to yeah, approve that Yeah, you have to second hearing? and vote on Okay, it. there's a motion to hear, to rehear the project. Is there a second? There's a second. All in favor of that motion? Okay, none opposed on that? Do you understand? You oppose? No, you're good. Okay, so we're all in agreement with the motion. Okay? Okay, and you're back to square one. Square one. <laughs> and if I might make one more comment as well, mm -hmm. I think had this been just square edged siding, it would not have been as hard a decision for us. But with the beaded edge siding, that's really the character defining yes. part of this. Mm -hmm. And in the material that the applicant's proposing, it does come with the option of a beaded edge siding that I think could be, could be subject to review by the staff. But that might be one option that would help us to retain 
some of the character defining element of, of this house. Can we refer that to the applicant? Legal, is that okay? That we can hear that again, okay? Do you mind restating the question, sir? Yes. Sure, uh, in the material you're proposing for the exterior siding, it comes with a beaded edge option. Okay. And that's a standard product of their product line, so. Are you speaking specifically of Hardy Board? Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I tend to use many different suppliers, so, um, sure. but I, that's a fair compromise, I think. Mm. And I'm open to that detail. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's, as, that's as, awesome. again, as long as it's readily available and doesn't cause any delays with the construction. Sure. Right. Okay, so Vice Chair, I guess we can make that new motion. So go again. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you for that information. So, so we've agreed to hear, to rehear the motion. So do we, do we change the motion or do we keep the motion as it was? You can keep the same motion if you want. Okay. With your addition. Yeah, and, and I think I had in there that the siding would be reviewed by the staff. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. With the same beaded edge. So it's the same, yeah, same motion. Do you please restate? Okay, I'll do it. Uh, with respect to 1627 Fatherland Street, I move for approval of the proposed addition with the conditions outlined in the staff report uh, with the one modification that the original wood siding uh, may be replaced uh, with uh, material that meets the specifications of the design guidelines and will be reviewed by the staff, uh, as well as detailing of the lap exposure as well as detailing of trim around windows and that we encourage the applicant to use a uh, beaded smooth siding uh, for uh, for staff review and approval. There is a motion. Oh, There's a good motion. Is there a second? second? There is a second. All in favor of that motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Good. That passed. All right. Thank you, commissioners. And thank you, Vice Chair, for that additional thank applicant, you. thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Next up is 1907 18th Avenue South, a circa 1961 non contributing brick duplex that does not contribute to the historic character of the neighborhood. Staff has already issued a demo permit for that structure. Uh, the applicant is proposing to construct infill. The lot is flanked um, by a historic house to its immediate left, and then it's actually, this lot's the last lot in the historic overlay, or I'm sorry, the conservation overlay. Um, to the right are some larger apartment buildings. Um, you can see the little brick house there in the middle. Um, and here are some photos. The top um, shows houses that um, are immediately to the left of the brick duplex. And then across the street um, are the houses on the bottom. That's a mixture of, um, there's one two-story historic house across the street, uh, several one and a half stories, and then the house in the middle is infill that was constructed prior to the overlay. The applicant is proposing infill that is one and a half stories in scale with a maximum height of approximately 30 feet from grade. Staff finds this to match the historic context. The house's width will be approximately 34 feet, which also meets the historic context. The infill's design is inspired by a Sears catalog house from the early 20th century. Here is the site plan. The infill is meeting all the base zoning setbacks, and its front setback will line up with the historic house to its left, which is appropriate. Uh, the staff is recommending the construction of a front walkway from the sidewalk to the front porch. Here is the left side elevation, which has a wall space of over 23 feet without a window or door opening. Staff recommends that the applicant add to this front area uh, at least one vertically oriented window that is at least two feet eight inches wide by three feet, I'm sorry, by five feet six inches tall. So basically um, the window height should be as big or bigger than the um, windows in the gable field. Uh, also, this um, portion of the dormer here is not inset two feet from the wall below, so staff is recommending that that portion be inset two feet. Um, similar recommendations on the right facade. We are asking that those windows that are pointed in the red or the pink um, be enlarged uh, slightly so that they are as tall or taller than the windows in the gable field. And then similarly, this portion of the dormer is not inset two feet, and we are recommending that it be inset two feet. Here is the rear elevation, and again, asking that these 
portions of these dormers be inset two feet. Here are the floor plans. Here are some renderings. And finally, staff is recommending approval with these conditions. The finished floor height be consistent with the finished floor heights of the adjacent, adjacent historic houses. The dormers on the side elevations be inset a full t two feet from the walls below. On the left facade, the applicant add to the front area at least one vertically oriented window that is at least two feet, eight inches wide by five feet, six inches tall, matching the size of the windows in the gable field. Um, similar recommendation on the right side, um, we were asking that the windows be at least, um, at the front part, be at least five feet, six inches, I'm sorry, two feet, eight inches by five foot, six inches to match the windows in the gable field. The applicant add a walkway from the sidewalk to the front porch. Um, the staff approve all materials and the location of the utilities and HVACs. Uh, with these conditions, staff finds that they meet the Belmont Hillsboro Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. Thank Melissa, you. quick question. Yes, Can sir. we go back to the windows, please? Yes. Just for clarification, the one, the two rear windows that are the same size, we're not requiring that generally just because it's in the back? Just because it's okay. in the back. I mean, generally the back half of the house were a little bit more lenient. Oh, really? um, okay. So staff found that back there it was fine. But just those front okay. ones are usually what are most visible from the front facade. Sure. Just wanted mm -hmm. to clear that up since they're yeah. the same size on yeah. the same facade. Yes. So yes. Thank you. And you do historically often see smaller windows kind of on the other side of chimneys. My house has those. Um, but. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Applicant. Okay. The applicant. I don't think the applicant's here. here. Uh, I'm sorry, Melissa, did you? Oh, the I'm applicant sorry. is not here. Okay. Um, open public hearing. Close public hearing. Okay. Discussion or a motion? Madam Chairman, with respect to 1907 18th Avenue South, I uh, recommend approval with all staff conditions. Thank you. There's second. A, there's a second. Two, two seconds. <laughs> Whoever got there first. <laughs> and um, all those in favor of the motion. Okay. I do not hear any opposed, so the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, um, so several emails concerning this project were received this morning um, and copies of those are on your desk. So the house located at 1204 Russell Street was built circa 1890 um, and contributes to the historic context of the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The commission last reviewed this case in July um, for a partial demolition that exceeded the scope of a preservation permit uh, that was issued to demolish non-contributing rear additions and to repair the foundation. Uh, since that time, plans were submitted and a preservation permit was issued for the reconstruction of the historic house. Uh, at that time, the commission advised the applicant to stop working on the addition and outbuilding. Um, work, however, has continued um, even since the staff recommendation for this project was finalized. Um, so just gonna show a couple photos and then we'll get into the, the proposed addition. Um, so the photo on the left shows um, the front facade around the time of the, the July meeting, and the photo on the right was taken, um, was taken this Monday. Uh, work is underway for the reconstruction, but additional demolition has taken place, including removal of all window casings on the house except for one on the front bay. The applicant has also continued working on the addition, the photo on the left, is the addition prior to the July meeting and the photo on the right was taken on Monday. Uh, a new stop work order was put on the property um, this past Friday. And here is the outbuilding that is under construction. Elevations for the outbuilding were submitted um, after the application deadline for, for this meeting, but a site plan has not yet been submitted for the outbuilding. So for the proposed addition, um, the application is for a one and a half story addition to a one story historic house. As proposed, the addition is no wider than the historic house and does not more than double the footprint that was in place before the non-contributing rear additions were removed. Uh, the addition extends two feet taller than the historic house. Um, 
and is inset appropriately from the rear corners, two, two feet from the left rear corner and approximately three and a half feet from the right rear corner. You can see on the footprint, um, the addition goes back before widening out to match the width of the historic house um, on, on the left side. Um, so as you see here, the, the taller portion of the sidewall on the, on the, the left side um, does line up with uh, the sidewall of the historic house. Typically, um, the guidelines require that to be, the, to be set in two feet. However, staff finds that this could be appropriate in this case, given um, since, it, since the additional height is such a small portion of the addition, it's uh, located approximately 80 feet behind the front wall of the historic house. Uh, the addition um, incorporates eaves that sit below those of the historic house and the addition ties in below the ridge of the historic house, which helps maintain the unique roof, roof form that is original to the house. So and here is the right elevation. So staff finds that the, um, the proposed addition can meet all of the design guidelines. And here's the front elevation. Uh, there's no change from uh, what was permitted with the reconstruction. Staff did find evidence that that small dormer was actually added after 1968 or 69. It was not there on uh, a property assessor photo we were able to, to find. So uh, that was permitted to be removed with the reconstruction. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project with the following conditions. Uh, staff approve all windows, doors, and the roofing material details prior to purchase and installation. No additional preservation permits be issued until the reconstruction has been inspected and reviewed by the commission as to whether or not it is a true reconstruction of the historic building. Uh, this condition um, has been included for similar cases where demolition of a historic house has exceeded what was permitted, which is why staff is recommending um, that in this case as well. And three, the location of utility meters and mechanicals shall be reviewed prior to an administrative sign off on a building permit if located anywhere forward of the midpoint. So with these conditions, staff finds that the proposed addition meets section four for materials, six for additions of part one of the design guidelines for turn of the century, 20th, turn of the 20th century districts, as well as the Lachlan Springs East End chapter of part two of the design guidelines. Thank you, Melissa. Is there any questions to Melissa at the moment? So just for re the last meeting that we saw this, a two-story, an unpermitted in any way, two-story addition was happening. We issued a stop and we Correct. issued a stop work order and to reconstruct what they had demolished in order to build that two-story addition. Correct? Or... So at, and I now believe, this is a one and a half story, so this is different. So they've taken down this image, <laughs> right? Correct. So let me go back to the photos. Image figure three on page ten. Right. So the photo on the left is what was there when you yes. reviewed it in July. Mm -hmm. um, as of Monday, the photo on the right is what is there, okay. which looks more similar to what is proposed. But we haven't. Our inspector hasn't been out and measured since we have an issue to permit. But it looks like they're there are some dissimilarities to what is proposed with this application. Okay. So let's go back to the permit. Sure. So uh, just to be really clear, because he's been here before. So this is close to what the permit was originally? Well, there, there was no permit. There was no addition permit. At all. So it you was, just built it without a permit? That's correct. Okay. Yes. It wasn't a show clause the last time, was it? Or was it? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're here right now. Um, unless show cause is for work done differently than permitted, not for work done without a permit. Okay. Okay. All right. I think we may, may have some more questions, but I think it's okay. so good. we're good for the moment. How about that? Uh, if you have any other questions, thank, thank you. you, Melissa. Sure. Applicant. Um, hello, my name is uh, Paul John Boulevard. I live work at uh, 1222 Eastdale Avenue, and I'm the architect that is helping Jose and uh, Jeanette with their renovation addition to their home on Russell Street. They have hired me to help them through this process after their previous um, conditions on their construction. 
<clears throat> Jose has asked me to prepare a statement that best captures his thoughts and read them to you today. He is self-conscious of his English and would like for me to read this statement. These are his thoughts. First, I would like to extend many thanks to Melissa and Sean for helping me through this process. I understand that your job is challenging normally, and when you add someone that does not speak English well, I want to thank, say thank you for your patience. I feel the committee might mistake my ignorance or lack of language skills as something intentional. This is not the case at all. I take full responsibility for my actions. The only person that is affected by these missteps are me and my family. As you might imagine, this has been very costly to us. I am grateful that I have been connected with Paul, who is both professional and experienced with the means and methods of the Historic Commission and has helped me recapture the historic nature of the existing home as well as the proposed addition. I have been in the construction industry for over 20 years but have never owned a home of my, home of my own. My wife and I have worked for over 20 years to have and find our dream house. As you know, the market in Nashville is tough, especially for a historic home. We felt very lucky to get this home. We love the original details and the appearance of the home. We want to work and maintain all of these details in the renovation. I promise that I will build back the historic home exactly as it was. I would like to make one request that I can work on the existing house and the addition at the same time. I have been patient in this process working with Paul and the historic staff to make things right. The delay in the process has caused me considerable financial setbacks. There have, there have been many materials that have been stolen from the job site and my dumpsters continually get filled with other people's trash. This has caused me great expense. I am not a rich person and I work very hard to make this dream a reality for my family. I have a loan from the bank to help make all of this possible. I please ask you to let me finish my house as soon as I can. I am not asking to do anything that is not appropriate in the historic nature of the neighborhood. I want to complete my home with something that is approved by the staff, you the commission, and the guidelines. In conclusion, I appeal to everyone on the commission's good heart. I pray to God that you all give me the opportunity to finish my house as soon as possible. God bless to you all. Thank you for your time. Do you have any comments as his uh, architect? Uh, I, I, um, I, I mean, I've enjoyed working with Melissa and Sean on uh, getting, getting through the process and getting the original house documented. I want to say thank you to 912, who provided us with some original as-built documentation so I could provide a set of documents that we could get approved so that Jose could get back to kind of reconstructing the existing home. Um, gone back and forth with Jose and Melissa uh, to to come up with a strategy that that I think kind of balances between what was built without a permit and what is what what can meet within the guidelines, and that's what that's what we have presented to you today. So, as to what's happening on site right now, I I I, I don't know the current conditions that's happening. I don't I don't monitor the site conditions. Uh, on a, when on a were you basis. hired? Um, I was hired uh, probably about a month ago, maybe okay. maybe five weeks ago. You are going to make sure he understands to no more work until that preservation permit is issued. A absolutely, I've I've communicated to him the process um, about you know the historic home versus the addition, and I know that your recommendation is to say that we have to have the historic home completed before the addition commences. The only comment that, that I have in his notes that he wanted to communicate to you all today was that he would like them to, to, to happen simultaneously just, be, just for, the, for, for cost. So, uh, and that's, that's the only ask outside of the commission comments. And, and we'll probably discuss that, but, but um, Mr. Hurtado, 
do you understand now that you must have a permit before you do any more work? This is my second time to say this in this public hearing. Okay, thank you. Um, it's really important that you understand that because other permits or non-permits come to this commission and we do, that's our purview. That is what we are charged to do. And so help us do that. Um, and we want to help you as well, but you must follow the rules. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, we may ask you some other questions. Um, I'm going to open up public hearing and close public hearing. Commissioners. I'm just going to jump in without, I'm not talking about the design of the addition yet. Um, I feel like this commission was extremely generous in granting the exceptions that we did last time. And I am extremely disappointed to see that construction of an outbuilding in addition to everything else we've been talking about has started, which makes me realize that the client does not understand what we've asked. And it makes me very wary of making any more exceptions. Duly noted. So to be clear, what our staff is asking is just complete the historic portion. Uh, do not do any additional work on the rear addition, not mentioning Dadu, correct? That is correct. And in addition to that, once it's completed, it would come back before this, this body so that you can verify that the reconstruction is accurate. But at the same time, we are not asking them to demolish the addition part. They, you know, applicant can just leave it, but do not touch it. Just complete the historic portion of the house. Uh, we had not recommended that this time, but um, it was recommended at the, the July meeting. Right. So I think that's a very generous compromise. I mean, it, we have worked understand, you know, language barrier because I'm coming from, you know, a different country and become the U U.S. citizen. So I really understand the struggle to, uh, you know, language barrier and not mentioning, you know, additional historical requirement. But, you know, it is so important for the, you know, community as well. So I think this is a great compromise. I, I understand it's a hard, but I think rule is a rule and we cannot, you know, keep allowing the applicant to keep breaking it. So we'd like to see, you know, we do our part, so applicant do their part following uh, the set of the rule. Duly noted. I agree, I'd be, you know, while I understand, you know, the wish and desire to, to, do, the, the, to do them concurrently, at this point with the application and with the correspond, you know, a, saying to stop work, now new work has happened. I just think that the good faith effort has now ended on our part and we need to be shown that it can be done before we permit anything else. Um, so I'm with, I'm with the other commissioners on that. Again, duly noted. Commissioner, have any comments? On, on the design, perhaps? <laughs> um, you know, again, a difficult uh, situation. I, I do think that the presence of 10 stop work orders in the last four and a half months, including one on September 10th, is concerning with this. And as, as much as I would like to grant the applicant's desires, I think that at this point it's, it's really incumbent upon the commission to, to make sure that the work gets done in accordance with the guidelines. And in that respect, uh, I move for um, with respect to 1204 Russell Street that uh, uh, move for approval with all staff conditions. There's a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor of the motion. Aye. None opposed. That motion carries. We appreciate you working with Mr. Hurtado um, to be sure that this, so there's not a permit right now. Yeah. Okay. Let's be really I, clear. I, I understand. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Estado. Thank you. All right.
The next application um, is to construct infill in an outbuilding at 1015 Halcyon Avenue. Uh, the site is currently a vacant lot. In March 2021, the commission approved infill in an outbuilding for the site that was not constructed. Uh, the subject property is situated between two non-contributing houses um, that were constructed prior to the adoption of the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay District. Uh, the photo on the left shows, oh, I sorry, skipped ahead. The photo on the left shows the two houses directly to the left of the site, while the photo on the right shows the house to the right of the site. Um, while there are several non-contributing houses on this block, um, there is also a distinct historic context. Of the contributing homes on this block, um, there are four nearby historic homes on similarly sized lots as 1015 Halcyon. All four of these historic homes are modest one and a half stories uh, with the maximum height uh, being approximately 27 feet from grade and width of approximately 36 feet. Um, the proposed infill is approximately 27 feet tall from grade and 36 feet wide at the front. Uh, the infill widens to 39 feet, about 25 feet beyond the front wall. Um, the new construction reads as a tall one and a half stories at the front. The side elevations read more as, as two stories, uh, given the eave heights as well as the wall dormer on the left side facade. Um, staff finds that the overall height and width, which are at the high end of the historic context along with the scale, of the side elevations push the overall scale to a large one and a half story infill that's inappropriate for the historic context. Um, the applicant has submitted a proposed solution, which you'll see during his presentation, that includes removing um, the additional width on the, on the right side, um, as well as setting the front dormer in an additional uh, several feet to help reduce the scale of that. Uh, staff is concerned that these changes, however, may not address the overall scale issue since the infill would still max out the height and width of the historic context while including the two-story elements on the side facades. So here's the proposed rear facade. The proposed infill meets all base zoning setbacks, um, and the project includes an outbuilding that meets all of the guidelines except for the 20-foot separation. Uh, the proposed solution includes removing that um, that small projection at the rear, which would address um, that separation. Um, although the outbuilding can meet the, des the design guidelines, um, it's not known how it will compare to the revised infill if the current proposal is not approved. Um, in addition, codes won't allow for the construction of an outbuilding without uh, a primary building. So for those reasons, staff recommends disapproval of the outbuilding as well as the infill. So in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the proposed infill and outbuilding, finding the project does not meet sections 5A for massing and scale and 5B for form of part one of the consolidated design guidelines for the turn of the 20th century neighborhood conservation zoning overlays. Thank you, Melissa. Applicant? Thank you, commissioners. My name is Van Pond. I am the architect architect for this. I have a handout for you, which I'll also provide to Melissa for record. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. Thank you for uh, hearing our presentation. Like you, we received staff's final comments on this project last Thursday afternoon. Um, we had previously worked with staff to do a major revision um, a week before. And so we have not taken this project lightly, nor have we taken the guidelines lightly. We have, I have read the guidelines and reread the guidelines and tried my very best to understand intent. Um, I work for a homeowner. I work for someone who's going to live here. They're not going to immediately sell this. I can't guarantee they'll never sell it. That's not realistic. but. They intend to move here and live here for a good long time. Um, I wanted to bring a couple of things up and be very brief about it. Um, as Melissa mentioned, you all had approved last year an infill proposal. That proposal was essentially the same width as this house, maybe a foot narrower. Uh, it was the same height. It did max out the height, 27 feet. Um, you also approved an outbuilding infill. Our proposed footprint right now is about four feet deeper. It is consistent with 
um, houses to the left and right. I understand those are not historic houses. I know those are not contributing. This house sits in a unique position. There are, if you look at the handout I gave you, it is surrounded on both sides by non-contributing structures, but also one more layer over a non-contributing structure. And its face of the street is all but one non-contributing structure. I'd like you to give us a little consideration there. We did actually look to the opposite side of the street, to 1012 House Inn, for basic massing concepts for this house as a cross gable. Melissa, if you would, or whoever's controlling all this. <laughs> oh, that might be dangerous, but we can try it. <laughs> um, so after getting staff's recommendations, we did respond to staff and, and give them this information. If you look on the site plan, you can probably see on your screens, at the bottom part of the house, we have, we have removed the projection to the south in plan or the bottom in plan of the proposed great room to put, bring it in line with the face of the house. So this makes the house 36 feet in width. If you look on the sketch context plan I provided, we did look at our neighborhood and at the contributing structures. The contributors, and we've given you some, we did go out and hand measure all the widths. These structures are very typical of kind of Queen Anne, early turn of the century houses, and they step in and out and have bays and things, so they appear narrower at the street than they may actually be. Um, we did take only the structures in our block, on our street face, and came up with a average width of 36 feet 8 inches. We did not take the, ha the houses on Paris Avenue that are shown. Those are behind us. We showed those just for context as what surrounds us. Um, reducing the width of this house to 36 feet is what staff is getting toward with us. Uh, we have no problem doing that. Um, staff mentioned that the building is 18 feet from the proposed outbuilding. There was a projecting bay. You'll see on this site plan that we have re removed that. So we are 20 feet away from the outbuilding. We are well within the limits of all base zoning, footprint, building footprint requirements. Um, we are between, I think you'll see here, this is a contextual elevation to the right of the subject property is a single house that is almost a shotgun in plan. If you'll see that, that's front to back of the lot. That was built, that's contemporary, as are the two large scale houses to the left that are full two stories. The contemporary to the right is a story and a half, and our eave height is actually a little bit lower than it. Our primary eave height is a little bit lower than that. As we face the street, we made a great effort to make sure that as the roof faces the street and comes down, it does address the street at the height of other porches on the historic houses across the street, so it has a nine foot two inch bearing. Again, to demass the house. We did not realize, I did not realize, my fault, that the dormer uh, proposed on the front facade projected beyond and on, on top of the porch. We did pull that back 18 inches to bring it in line with the wall below, which is also typical of the houses across the street. If we go into those photographs, you'll see that they have dormers that are in plane with the face of the house, not the porch. This is an illustration of the uh, front elevation again. This house is using reclaimed random ashlar limestone from salvage from a house that was torn down in Green Hills. Uh, that will be the base foundation. There was a question in your report on that from staff about what that was. That will be that reclaimed limestone. On the side elevation, you'll see that we have reduced the face of the, the projecting roof of the house is now in plain as a simple shed dormer. Um, you can see the profile on the top left of the dormer being reduced and then on the bottom right of removing the bay window. We did rediscover one error in our quick revision. The rear dormer, the rear side dormer on the left was drawn incorrectly. It is now properly scaled with a 5 and 12 pitch roof. Uh, that was unintentional, but in speed that's what we got. And then this is the other side elevation. I want to make one point about this. This is a shed, partial shed dormer. It is 24 feet 8 inches back from the face of the front of the house. This was intentionally done so that the dormer would not be visible from the street. This, uh, this shed dormer is less than one half the width of the whole facade, um, and we have, and we feel like it is appropriate. It's not going to be visible from the street. 
And the houses next door to this, as you saw, are much taller and will mask any longer view of that. They do, as we do sit in line with those. Um, that's what I've got. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we are happy to work with staff on this. We have taken their comments to heart. Um, we think that this, given its context, given where it's sitting between houses on the street that it's surrounded by, is appropriately scaled. Um, it is not taller than what's already there. It is responsive to the historic house's textures, but not to the point that it is lost in the new context. I appreciate your consideration, and, and any questions you have, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Pond. Mm -hmm. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Questions or comments, commissioners? If I can't find the report. Do we know what's the uh, proposed depth as designed on this house? Sorry, Melissa. <laughs> I'm trying to look for it myself and I can't find it. It's 74 feet. No. Say it again. How much? 74 feet 74 from front feet. to back. Yeah, okay. and staff did find that to be compatible with nearby homes, especially those with additions. So, I was just curious. I actually went, again, completely different. This is a new case. But just for reference, I went back to the March design just to see, remind myself what it was. Um, different architect. I don't know if it's a different owner or not. But... Um, just kind of making some comparisons because I mean again I, I look back at that which was approved but not constructed and it just reads as a one and a half story house um, in that previous proposal and and this one to me does read as just on the larger side of width and height and it's deeper than that previous one again that previous one shouldn't matter but I just kind of wanted to see but mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those are, it just, it does look a lot different than the, the one that was previously approved um, because that one did read as a true one and a half story and just, it looked a lot um, less deep and I think that's the beauty of the, you know, massing it properly. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I commend Afrikan, they did, you know, he did a really good job, however, you know, this is a way very Belmont neighborhood conservation, much, much larger area. So we cannot compare, you know, out of character, uh, non-conforming existing house to, you know, conforming design guideline. Because the previous uh, plan, as Commissioner Jones stated, is proper mass and proper form. Uh, unlike this one is maybe few feet, about few feet makes a difference. So the massing and form is not a historical context. So massing scale and form are definitely, you know, uh, quite departure from historical content. So sometimes, you know, people, uh, neighborhood get together and then all of a sudden uh, start having a conservation overlay because oh my God, we don't want to have that, that kind of house coming into our neighborhood. So that's kind of trigger. So, you know, as our body, just because it's similar to non-conforming, uh, we won't be able to accept it. So I think uh, staff recommendation is right on. Uh, applicant can keep working with the staff and then uh, coming, uh, you know, the height as it may be okay to have a two story, but make it look like, you know, a one and a half story and depth is okay. So staff gives lots of tool to work with. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, there's more room for the improvement. Uh, just, you know, not this scale. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, I agree with both Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Johnson. 
I don't know. I'm feeling I'm feeling a little bit a little bit torn on some of the elements. I am a bit compelled by the fact that the majority of the block is non-conforming. Um, and while we're maxing out, while this this project's maxing out the height and the width, it's not exceeding the height and the width. I think it's coming down to like, is it truly reading as a one and a half story versus a two story? Um, I don't know. I'm just feeling torn. Just wanted to express <laughs> that. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it is a, one that's difficult because um, the, the guidelines state where there's little historic context, existing construction may be used for contract, context. Generally, a building should not exceed one and a half stories. Well, uh, you know, th this building is sandwiched between really three buildings that are similar scale and two-story, you know, different, different scale than the historic, but it's directly across the street from from three uh, contributing structures that are clearly smaller in scale. So uh, I'm struggling with this one as well. So, I think we have had discussion on how we view a new infill. And I think you were saying it, but saying it sort of in different words. But yes, there's contributing. I mean, Waverly Belmont has so many contributing uh, structures. And this particular, I mean, on one side there isn't, but on the other side there is. So, and it actually, if you go down further on Halcyon, it's just, you know, much more contributing as well. So, yeah, just commenting. Um, and, and it's not... I believe it's Belmont Hillsboro that was more also, and they're very close, where their uh, comments and, and their guidelines is, you know, not to make things bigger because there's so many things that keep continue to expand and expand and expand that, you know, let's get it back down to a uh, reasonable um, context to historic structures. So just remembering and recalling comments that the neighborhood has made in the past. I guess this is a question for staff, like what, is it a certain eave height that would bring it into a one and a half story compliance? Um, I'm hesitant to say it's a certain eave height. It's kind of different um, elements taken together um, that create the overall massing that kind of makes it look larger than, than the homes of the historic context. So, I mean, so typically for, for infill projects, um, staff tries to provide feedback early on. And so we look at the height, we look at the width, and we provide like, you know, what's kind of the maximum, but usually we also provide the feedback that infill that maxes out the height and the width may not be appropriate. And I think this is kind of one of those cases where I'm not sure if you've nickeled and dimed the, de the design, it's going to um, to kind of bring it to where it's more compatible with the historic context. So, Melissa, we do have a significant shed dormer on one side that is not set back from the exterior wall. Is that, uh, I think it's on the other side. There, it's, it's not really a, I mean, it is a shed dormer, but it goes out flush with the wall. Does that have something to do with this? Would that make a significant difference? Right, um, and I think it's on, on the side facades, the shed dormer along with that taller eave height that's kind of pushing the scale upwards to tall one and a half to two story. Um, typically we see that sort of eve height on really on a two story house. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me it would, that, that's really the only part of this structure that to me really feels like two stories. And, uh, and, and that is one that if it'd be possible to set that wall back, uh, that would, that would make a difference in, 
lowering that perception to me. So, does that make sense, Melissa? Do you? So I think for that sense, you know, the plan as we submit it to us is kind of pushing the mass and the scale and form. So, but there's still good uh, opportunity to meet our guideline mm -hmm. without, you know, changing dramatically. So I think as plan as submitted does not meet, but staff can definitely work with the applicant and then suggest what will make to meet more in line with the historic content. So I would like to suggest, you know, applicant to keep working with the staff and then present us better plan, not the currently submitted. Would you like to make any other comments? I was just gonna say if we're headed in, in that direction, then I, I agree with Commissioner Stewart. It's the only, the only elevation really that I feel like needs work is that east elevation. Then I, I feel like the other ones have the feel of a one and a half story. So uh, based on that, uh, with respect to 1015 Halcyon, I, uh, I move for, um, for denial of disapproval of, of the proposed plans uh, per staff recommendations. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. The motion passes. Thank you, applicant. All right, uh, 1808 Holly Street. I didn't put in a picture of the existing. It is currently a vacant lot, vacant lot, sorry, in a little box here. Um, a non-contributing building, a duplex building, occupied the lot previously, and that was destroyed by the tornado in March of last year. Uh, and the commission approved a two-story infill on the lot in May of last year. Uh, this is a new application with a new owner, and it is a proposal to construct a new one-and-a-half-story duplex building. The building is proposed 33 feet wide and 25 feet tall um, from grade on the plans. The house has a side-gabled form with a pair of front-gabled porches and a pair of shed roof front dormers. Uh, with some modifications outlined in the staff recommendation, staff finds the form and overall scale to be compatible with the historic context. Uh, staff recommends that the drawings be corrected to show the accurate grade. Uh, the lot slopes down, f down from the alley to the street. Uh, staff also recommends that the finished floor should be consistent with that of adjacent historic houses uh, and that uh, it, there is an adjacent historic house to the left. And, and that the ridge height not exceed 25, uh, 26 feet tall from grade. Uh, additionally, the front dormer should step back as is typical of historic dormers and be reduced in width so that combined, they don't exceed 50% of, of the width of the building. Uh, the materials uh, are generally appropriate as well with some clarifications outlined in the staff recommendation. Staff recommends approval of the proposed one and a half story duplex at 1808 Holly Street with conditions that the plans are uh, as written on the screen. I can read them if you'd like me to. <laughs> it's a long list. Okay, I can answer questions and the applicants here. Okay, thank you, applicant. If you would like, sure. it is your prerogative. <laughs> you have waited this long. I'm the last. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We and we thank it. you for your patience. No, thank you all for staying here. I was kind of worried that we were going to shut down at 5 p.m. Um, 
I'm John Wagaman. I live at 101 Rosebank, 37206, and I am the applicant on 1808 Holly. Um, we did, we're, uh, we agree with, with all of the uh, staff recommendations, and we've made updates. I just, I didn't send them until noon today, so I understand why you guys didn't get them. I have paper copies. Um, I do have, I guess, one question, one clarification. Um, I was reading through the design guidelines for the for the Lachlan Springs neighborhood, and it's about number five, that the dormers shall be reduced to have a combined width of not more than half of the building, um, which would, in our case, give us an eight-foot, three-inch wide dormer. And as this is a two-family dwelling, um, it's going to create a seven-foot, three-inch bedroom uh, on the front there. So the question was, I wasn't sure, and you guys might just say, we always do 50%. I know that there's, you know, this would create precedent or could create precedent or whatever. The question just is, would you approve a dormer that is 61 or two dormers that would add up to 61% of the entire width, which would be about 10 feet wide, which would give us a nine foot, six inch bedroom inside. Um, I can pass this over, which on one of the pages just kind of shows you the difference of the floor plan, essentially, let me get the second floor one open. Um, just what it does to the interior footprint between the seven foot bedroom on the front and also it has, it does have what, it, what the house would look like with a, with the smaller dormers on the front, on the front elevation has been changed on that, on this plan update. I'm sorry, what's that? What are we looking at here? So the front dormer on that second, the second floor, you can see the left hand there is yeah. seven feet, three inches on the inside on that oh, bedroom. I see. So and then the right hand, we kept it the same size, which would allow a nine foot, six inch bedroom. And so it's nine foot six by about 10 feet, I believe. And we have no problem stepping in two feet. I, that's that's definitely appropriate. Actually, <laughs> give us a moment, I guess, if we're going to, we haven't had a chance to review that, so. Yeah, of course. We will, do you have another copy? Oh, I do. Robin, yeah, Robin does. Copy. Robin's got the copy. It's fine. Okay. Um, any other presentation? If not, I nope. will. Okay. That you is know, it. We might ask you more questions in a minute. Okay. Thank you. Um, and open public hearing and close public hearing. And we will discuss and have questions. On on that fifty percent, uh, half of the width. I th I think that's that's our guidelines, correct? Or is just to clarify, number five. Um, normally, we just say proportional to the size of the opening of the first story windows below, um, that, that didn't really work here because of the way the, the facade has door, window, window, door. So, you know, if there's a pair of windows, we could say, you know, match the upper story should have a pair of windows the same size as a pair below. Um, so um, I, I remember a discussion a long time ago about a dormer on a new construction, and I think we said around 50%. I couldn't find the exact. Uh, precedent, but it was so long ago, it'd be hard to say that that was binding by any measure today. Um, that's sort of where that came from.
sounds like you really don't have a precedent for the 50% no, not so much in, in, a, in a precise size uh, or percentage of size. Uh, we do say or have been consistent in saying that dormers should be primarily glazing. Um, and, you know, certainly this is a lot of glazing, but there is additional siding on, on the side. So I don't know if that was maybe sort of where that was focused, sure. uh, if not articulately written. In my sense, is this is a lot of house on this on this lot, <laughs> a lot of bedrooms, and uh, and I'm in an old uh, prairie style four square, and typically then they would have bedrooms, and there was a smaller bedroom that was either the nursery or you know uh, or, or office or study or something. You know, I, I can understand why they'd like for it to be this. When I look at that front elevation, though, uh, the dormers look awfully the, the, it looks awfully top heavy to me. And uh, I would think that uh, you know something more in the eight foot number would be better than nine foot six. That eighteen inches would be a lot, uh, and I think that would bring the scale down to some extent and, and help bring it back into conformance. In, in the absence of having guidelines that really stipulate what the actual number should be. I, I agree. I think that the two dormers at the top, you know, almost look larger than the entrance ways at the bottom. And I think that's what's throwing off the scale for me. Um, and, and so I'm kind of in agreement with keeping with the, the staff recommendation on this to kind of, you know, with the just making it more uh, fit with the size of the, the building and the width. Yeah, our guidelines are. Oh, yep, sorry. I totally <laughs> concur. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just uh, you know, looking at um, our guidelines, it's it's not you know hard and fast rule, but um, it does give some um, you know latitude on it. But I think it, it's right when you're looking at a, a massing and scaling, and you know the actual context for the building. So makes sense what the commissioners have. Expressed. Commissioner. <laughs> so if there's no other comment, uh, I make, uh, I move to accept staff recommendation with all associate uh, condition for 1801 Holly Street. There is a motion. Is there a second? 1808 Holly Street. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> there is a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of the motion? Okay. Any opposed? None opposed. The motion passes. Thank you, applicant, for working with staff. Staff, thank you for working with applicants. We've had a long day. Any other business, Ms. Siegler? Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.